Good morning, everyone. Welcome to um, the first day of our CalSTRS board meetings. Uh, we're opening up our investment committee meeting at September 1st, 2021. I can't believe the year has gone by so quickly or so slowly, depending on how you look at it. Um, I just want to say good morning to everyone and um, glad that everyone is here participating in the meeting and welcome to the public. Um, Scott, can you go ahead and call roll for us? Of course. Ms. Bradford? Here. Mr. Prasad? Here. Ms. Erden? Here. Ms. Yamamoto? Here. For the Director of Finance, Ms. Miller? Here. For the State Treasurer, Mr. Rufino? For the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mr. Johnson? Here. State Controller Yee? Here. Vice Chairperson Hendricks, you have a quorum. Great, thank you, Scott. And uh, we wanted to welcome Blake Johnson. I know uh, board members have gotten a chance to chat with him personally. We welcome you. We're glad to have you join um, our esteemed board and look forward to meeting you in person at some point um, on this journey that we're all on. So welcome, Blake. Uh, glad to have you. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're welcome. And um, before we jump into the business, I think it just felt awkward to just jump into business when there's so much going on in the world right now. And so I just wanted to acknowledge, I know for myself, LA Community College District started on Monday and there were some in-person classes going on. And I know Denise and a lot of teachers who are watching are figuring this out, figuring out how to start um, classes and whether that's in-person, online or hybrid. We've had lots of conversations with our chancellor to ensure our staff and students and faculty and teachers are safe. And it's it's kind of, uh, and we were hoping, Harry and I were hoping to have this meeting in person in September, and that's not happening either. So the Delta variant has just kind of put a lot of question marks on um, a lot of businesses and, and their ability to bring staff into the building for CalSTRS to bring staff back into the building. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge the start of school for educators, for students, for staff, for parents, and even having our, our chair right now having to drop off kids. <laughs> it's, uh, there's a lot happening. So, um, and I also just want to acknowledge, you know, with climate change and climate risk, having the fires happen in Tahoe, uh, the Dixie fire, uh, you know, the, the storms in uh, the hurricane Ida in Louisiana and people being devastated in Tennessee. There's just a lot happening um, in our state, in our country. Um, and I also just want to acknowledge um, what's happening in Afghanistan. My, uh, my nephew Kern has been a photojournalist in um, Kabul, Afghanistan, and was airlifted out two days before the, um, the strike happened on, on the airport last week. And so I just wanted to acknowledge the 13 U.S. service members and then the over 60 Afghan people that were killed last week in that Kabul air airport attack. Um, I did notice there was actually a service person from Sacramento, um, Nicole G, that was killed. And so I just wanted to take a moment of silence just to acknowledge all of the challenges that are happening um, around the world and just kind of take a moment of silence just to reflect on that in the midst of the business we have today. So if we could just take a moment, that would be great. Deep breath. Thanks, everyone. Um, and I will kind of start our meeting, um, you know, on in the memory of those lost. And also just I was reflecting on this quote by Amanda Gorman from the inaugural address, her incredible poetry. There is always light if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. And so uh, I've been reflecting a lot about how to be light in the places that I'm in, the places that I lead and speak and act in. And um, so in the midst of a lot of devastation and, and darkness and challenge, um, I'm hoping we can all be lights in the midst of the work that we have today um, on the investment committee. So with that, um, we're gonna transition into the business. Um, and item one is the approval of the committee agenda. I'd entertain a motion to approve. So moved. 
It's been moved. Second. And seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Great. Our agenda, our committee agenda has been approved. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to opportunities for statements from the public, and I need to read a few notes here. Um, the board will have a 10 minute public comment period at the end of each agenda item. We are making a modification today, just so everyone is aware. On item two, our uh, opportunities for statements from the public will be 20 minutes, and we're adding 10 minutes. So for a total of 20 minutes for item five's public comment. So just want to make sure everyone's clear on that. Public comment after each item will be limited to the agenda item topic. There will be an additional opportunity for statements from the public for items not pertaining to specific agenda items at the end of the open session meeting. Individuals wishing to speak at the board web conference should dial into the public comment line 833-986-0555 and wait in the call-in queue. Each speaker is allowed a maximum of three minutes for their presentation. If there's not enough time for speakers to have three minutes, the timing will be at the discretion of the chair. Teachers Retirement Board meetings are live web streamed and video archived, which are available to the public on calsters.com. To protect the privacy of minors who wish to address the board, public commenters under the age of 18 only state their name and affiliated organization, but do not share any personal identifying information such as last name, age, or school. So we'll now move on to item two, opportunities from statements of the public. This item is scheduled for 20 minutes. We will split that time between the callers. Comments made at this time may pertain to topics not covered by a specific agenda item. CalSERS accepts public comments in two forms, verbally and in writing. Before we take verbal comments, I'd like to summarize the written communication the board received in preparation for this meeting. So we've gotten form letter campaigns. CalSERS continues to receive letters from the following campaign. Fossil Free California and youth activists have initiated a form email campaign around February 27th of this year, requ requesting CalSERS to divest from Enbridge, who owns and operates an oil sand pipeline in the United States and Canada. CalSERS has received a total of 393 unique emails since the June meeting. Fossil Free California, 15 handwritten emails to the board since June regarding fossil fuel divestment. Uh, engagement requests. CalSERS received a letter from the American Federation of Teachers and the Massachusetts Nurses Association requesting CalSERS engage with Tenet Healthcare Corporation, a Dallas-based company that CalSERS has exposure to. The letter shared 800 nurses in Massachusetts are on strike and Tenet Healthcare refuses to improve staffing to ensure safe patient care. In our response, CalSERS referred to our stewardship priorities. United for Respect sent an additional letter to CalSTRS staff and board members on July 1st. On July 12th, External Affairs will meet with United or has met with United for Respect regarding private equity concerns, BC partners, and their management of PetSmart. And with that, I'll hand it over to Samantha to um, help us monitor the 20 minutes of public comment. Samantha? Thank you. Um, so each public commenter will be getting two minutes to speak. Our first caller is Kevin. Good morning, CalSERS board members. My name is Kevin Welch, and I am the chair of the Retirement Committee for the California Teachers Association, as well as this is my 26th year teaching here in California. CTA is enthusiastic about expanding the low carbon transition pathway to include a net zero emissions pledge. It is essential that we take concrete goals and measurable steps towards ensuring that the CalSERS investment portfolio includes sound and responsible long-term investment strategies that address and respond to the shifts towards a greener and more sustainable world and economy. As companies and governments around the world are prioritizing climate responsibility, our goal is to ensure that investment decisions across portfolios give CalSERS the competitive market advantage to maximize returns, as well as provide our members the dependable retirement they count on. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. Okay, our next caller will be Dana. 
Dana, go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, Dana Dillon, CTA retired vice president. Um, good morning, everyone. It's great to see all of you. Um, seems forever since we've actually spoken personally. Um, Sharon, thank you for your comments this morning. Uh, it'll surprise no one that knows me that I got a little teary eyed and you can hear it in my voice. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity too to first congratulate Cassandra and Lisa. Well done, ladies. And I'd also like to congratulate Chris, Kirsty, and her team, the investment shop, and really all of CalSTRS on your collaboration with Engine Number One and taking on the Exxon board. Bravo. In light of the Dutch court decisions against Royal Dutch Shell and the proxy boats at Exxon, Chevron, and the other oil companies, I encourage CalSTRS to leverage these successes as much as possible to complete the transition to a net zero portfolio sooner rather than later. Again, congratulations on your success with Exxon. I look forward to the transition that will be taking place in your approval of item number five. Keep on keeping on. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller will be Marcy. Marcy, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I'm Marcy Winograd, retired English teacher with the LA Unified School District, a member of CTA Divest, an organization of teachers within the California Teachers Association, calling on CalSTRS to begin divesting now because we are in the midst of a climate emergency. Uh, I ask that you join with a thousand other institutions around the globe in voting to divest $14.5 trillion from the deadly and dying fossil fuel industry. I know that CalSTRS uh, approach is to engage. I understand that perspective. On the other hand, I see that it is not working. Yes, you were able to elect some uh, more questioning members of the Exxon board, but they are still closely tied to the oil industry. And when you look at the facts, you see that uh, Exxon in which we have $400 million, is funding the largest oil facility yet in Guyana right now, expected to release 125 million tons of CO2, turning that place from a carbon sink to a carbon bomb. We have about $350 million in Chevron, which is funding 25 new oil drilling projects worldwide. Item number five, net uh, carbon neutral by 2050, needs to be amended. We need to start divesting now. We are losing money. The oil industry has been underperforming for two decades. Exxon was booted from the Dow. Uh, energy transfer, the company, uh, yes. Anyway, it, this is a losing proposition, losing money, losing for the climate, losing for our youth, losing for our teachers. Please digest now. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, our next caller will be Lynn. I'm Lynn, I'm Lynn Nittler, a retired teacher. As a retired teacher, I speak for the sake of the children of our world. They all deserve to live healthy and fulfilling lives without fear of failure and ensuing famine, deadly heat waves, lack of water, sudden deluges, or terrifying fires. For so many children in all parts of the globe, climate change is real right now. With the sixth IPCC report released, the global director of Save the Children wrote, quote, Today's report is a harrowing warning of what is to come, but millions of children across the globe are already experiencing irreversible impacts on their lives and life chances. If hungry or die in droughts, cyclones, and floods, they flee their homes to escape wildfires. Some 5.7 million children under five are already on the brink of starvation in this year's unprecedented food crisis, in which the climate crisis is a major factor. Children born today will experience the devastating impacts of the climate crisis far worse than their parents or grandparents. That makes this a children's crisis at its core. I'm still quoting. Children in lower income communities will be hardest hit as the crisis, like COVID-19, exacerbates inequalities within and between countries. With the scorching heat waves in North America, 
The widespread wildfires and the recent floods in Europe have shown that no place is safe. Humanity has the capacity and resources to tackle this crisis, but we must be determined to act as the window to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade is closing. Please divest from fossil fuels. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Okay, our next caller will be Joan. Joan, go ahead. Uh, good morning. Yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, go ahead. Good morning. Uh, my name is Joan Lohman from Oakland. First, I want to acknowledge Sharon for her powerful and thoughtful opening that really set a tone for today. Thank you so much, Sharon. Um, I'm a grateful beneficiary of my wife's Calster's pension from her 30-year career at City College in San Francisco. And today, she joins me in raising our voices on behalf of the over 800 water protectors arrested in an effort to protect indigenous land and water rights in northern Minnesota and stop Enbridge's Line 3 pipeline. At your recent board meeting, Chris Aylman told you not to worry about Calster's investments in Enbridge because they are passive investments that have nothing to do with the pipeline. How can we say on the right hand that our investment in Enbridge is passive? while the left hand of the same corporation is supporting environmental racism by paying hundreds of Minnesota police to arrest water protectors using torture tactics. Am I exaggerating? Thus, since your last board meeting, one of our young indigenous friends had her arm broken by Minnesota law enforcement, paid by Enbridge while she was in prayer. Another was placed in a head hold that dislocated her jaw and left her with a diagnosed case of Bell's palsy, which may be permanent. Enbridge is paying millions to hire these so-called peacekeepers. What does that have to do with you as responsible decision makers? Are you willing to acknowledge that Calsters has a moral responsibility to engage with Enbridge? Some indigenous women leaders would love to meet with you by Zoom or phone to share what it's really like to be trying to protect their land and waters. I challenge you to step into the moral leadership that your role as a CalSTRS board member requires. Dare to witness the human and environmental impact of your Enbridge investment. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next caller will be Carla. Carla, go ahead. Yes, good. Good morning, board members. My name is Carla McKello. I'm a retired adult education teacher and member of CFT. Only recently, I was horrified to learn that my CalSTRS pension money is being polluted, really, to enable the dangerous fossil fuel industry. Over five years ago, CFT made a resolution committing to a climate justice agenda a resolution which was passed along to this board to take action on. Yet this committee has dragged its feet to vote to divest its 16 billion investment in fossil fuels. Given the alarming code red that the latest UN Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change has given for the future of humanity, it is ever more urgent that Cal Sturds heed the warnings. I urge you all to listen to your membership, to take responsible leadership by divesting from continued climate-induced catastrophes, many of which you mentioned, Sharon, in our opening. The present moment opens an opportunity for CalSTRS to be brave enough to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Please act to represent your CFT teacher members and protect all life. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller will be Paula. Go ahead. Paula. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. My name is Paula Buell. I'm a retired teacher and a CalSTRS member. And all of you board members, I appreciated Sharon's comments today, and I know you take your job of safeguarding our pensions seriously. I know some of you support divestment privately, and I imagine others must be giving it serious thought. The most recent report from the International Panel on Climate Change is clear. We don't 
have much time to prevent the most catastrophic effects of global warming. As fossil fuel companies continue to drill and pollute a growing list of pension funds, including University of California, New York State, and the state of Maine are joining the divestment movement. As fires burn and hurricanes rage, it's time for all of us, teachers, retirees, and board members, to question why CalSTRS remains stubbornly attached to fossil fuels. Chief Investment Officer Chris Allen continues to support engagement. He says he wants us to keep a seat at the table. But why would you want to sit at that table? Do we really want our pension fund to go down with a ship on a leaky, stinky oil tanker? If CalSTRS had divested 10 years ago instead of wasting time on the engagement, the fund would be $5.5 billion richer today. We can't wait any longer for oil majors to change their ways. CalSTRS could be investing our pension where it will bring better returns and help to build our children's future. The other point I want to make is Carol Simon says divestment will make us invisible, but divestment makes us more visible, taking a moral stand as well as a prudent financial one. Thank you. I hope you'll make the right decision. Thank you Thanks for your comment. For the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your comment. Our next speaker will be Miriam. Miriam, go ahead. Hello. To start, I want to thank you for sharing about the widespread and devastating impacts of climate change across our country and across this world. As the Calder Fire, the Dixie Fire, and others range in California, Hurricane Ida uh, continues to devastate Louisiana. And just a few weeks ago, Tropical Storm Grace and the 7.2 magnitude earthquake hit Haiti and continues to disrupt almost any activity. This earthquake I pay particular attention to because it displaced placed this family of one of my dear friends and my Latin tutor for several years. For days, she had no idea where her family was, was not able to contact them. And this is all a result of climate destruction, which is in large part due to the fossil fuels that you, CalSTRS, support. In addition to natural disasters, fossil fuel industries are perpetrating violence in our communities every single day. Today, I want to share with you what is happening in my community back in Minnesota. As a Minnesotan living in California, I watch this news from afar with my heart crying. Line three is being constructed as we speak by the Enbridge Corporation. It's 90% complete. The construction process leads to irreversible pollution of rivers and drinking water due to frack outs, frack outs that happen every day almost. And also every day, indigenous women and children live in fear as they're kidnapped, raped, and murdered in order to serve the man camps of line three construction workers. This is absolutely unacceptable. And to protect this destruction, Enbridge is colluding with Minnesota law enforcement. I'm shaking as I read and as I wrote this. They're using escalating tactics of violence to violate water protectors. In the last few weeks, they've begun to use pain compliance. They've broken bones, dislocated joints, and used pressure points to force compliance. You, CalSTRS, are supporting this by continuing to fund the pipeline. It's time that you respond with the same anger that I feel in sympathy for this violence. It's time that you divest from Enbridge and from fossil fuels. It's time that you end support for the violation of indigenous people, water, protection, and comments. the earth. Uh, that is the conclusion of uh, public comment for item two. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you to our public for your comments. Um, we are moving on to item three, which is the approval of our minutes from our July 8th, which feels like forever ago. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve. Move okay. approval, Madam Chair. I move. Second. Seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Edits, Karen? Yes. Yeah. We're done. We're done. Oh, okay, good. As long as Karen approves. Okay, so we've approved the minutes. Um, uh, so now we are on to item four, the investment policy revisions. And I, I noted that this was a consent item, but I believe, um, Mr. Keeley, that you wanted to pull that. So yes. I'm going to you, Karen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to pull items 4A and 4B. Uh, I'm in support of the changes that are being recommended 
but for the purpose of pulling this item, I would like to reference the Makita memos for 4A and 4B. Specifically, I'm referencing the last paragraph in each one of their memos. So 4A and 4B, the Makita memo to the committee references the uh, benchmarks and Makita suggests, quote, the board review incentive comp target outperformance to harmonize these targets with active risk budgets across uh, set asset classes. This can be done as part of a broader benchmark review process. So what I'd like to suggest uh, Madam Chair, the committee is open to this relative to the Makita memos and the ongoing discussions that we've had around benchmarks is that we direct Makita or we, we ask Makita to do an overview of these issues regarding benchmarks during the 21-22 year and bring forth any recommendations for changes, if any, to the uh, full board uh, before the close of the 21-22 fiscal year. Rather than having these items be taken up uh, in a full board meeting and going through the, literally the sausage making of benchmarking and discussing those, have Makita review the benchmarks, referencing their memos, have them come back to us with any suggested changes, if any, uh, pros and cons, and uh, to do that during the 21-22 year. Thanks, Harry. Any other, Chris, did you want to chime in or Steve? I see Steve McCourt and Scott as well. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, mine's technical. Uh, I'll let Steve explain what uh, he'd like to do with the benchmarks. Um, on the fixed income on, I just wanted to let you know that uh, Bloomberg changed the name before we were able to, after we went to print and dropped the name Barclays. So now it's just the Bloomberg uh, aggregate. So just to note that change. So noted. Thank you, Chris. Uh, St Steve, did you want to comment on Harry's suggestion? Uh, no, no, no comment other than we're happy to, um, to uh, take that direction. Any feedback from other board members about this? I mean, I think the original idea was to have a work group, um, but it seems like having Makita give input. I see a physical hand and a <laughs> so I saw Gail's hand first and then I'll go to you, Bill. So um, Gail, I have to remember how to do this. Gail? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wholeheartedly support this approach and, and really appreciate Mr. Keeley um, taking more of a holistic approach. And I think this just informs so much of, of what we've been looking at and, and ways to, to not only have our benchmarks easier to understand for us, but for our team and, and ultimately maybe even for compensation. So I, I really think this was just a great idea and um, I'm just so pleased and, and happy to support in any way I can. Great. Thanks, Gail. Um, and then let's go to Bill. Uh, you know, I, I uh, agree with Gail. I think this is a, and Harry, thank you for bringing this up. Um, I do have one question because of the uh, breadth of the uh, year, 21-22, uh, to maybe uh, ask Steve, you know, do you have some idea of when you might be able to come back to the board with your recommendation? Yeah, I, I guess, first of all, what I would say is ideally we'd want to come back maybe a couple of times to uh, solicit feedback on uh, our thoughts and ideas and concepts around uh, benchmarking. So um, uh, it probably would make sense to start those meetings at the beginning of calendar year 2022. And as, as Mr. Keeley alluded to, target completion um, and adoption of any changes before the end of the fiscal year. Thank you. Great, thanks, Bill. I'll go to Betty. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Bill, for your question. Exactly my point is um, I don't want to just see recommendations without some context, and so I hope we can have a uh, maybe a timeline um, or a, a little kind of uh, truncated work plan, if you will, on this very issue, just so we have expectations about what's coming to us. But uh, I think really building the context that leading up to the recommendations is going to be important. Thanks, Betty. Um, let's go to Jennifer Ernan. Jennifer. 
Thank you, Sharon. Um, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with everything that's been said as well. And I just wanted to ask Chris, um, as well as Makita, given the delay, do you see any um, issue implementation issues or would you um, please come forth to us uh, if you see any implementation issues of not making this change now? I, I hope we can take a holistic view and I hope we can do that with a clear timeline but want to be sensitive or aware if there's any, if that presents any challenges for, for you or the team during this interim time. Um, from the investment staff's perspective, um, it's a challenge. Um, fixed income is just going to stay with the structure they currently have where they have a clear division between internal management and external management. Uh, going to a risk budget would have given them a bit more flexibility of choosing between those two categories. Uh, and then within CIS, um, I guess the, the, you already established an active uh, public equity portfolio for them. In the policy was the risk budget. This would just uh, get the actual range adopted. So I guess I'm thinking, um, uh, obviously I'm going at it live here. Um, I, I think they would continue to manage the portfolio the way they have. They wouldn't make any changes now because of the lack of a risk budget because they wouldn't have the flexibility. It would be more rigid of how much is in activists and how much is in the uh, uh, sustainable managers uh, instead of giving them a, a fluid chance to shift between those. Is that a problem for us? No, it basically, we continue to invest in the status quo. Um, and I guess just have to mentally back up and not change the way we manage the portfolio. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank uh, you. Harry, back to you. And Sharon, it, it appears that there's um, support for, for the suggestion and I would concur, and I apologize to everyone for not uh, outlining in, in my suggestion that there would be touch points along the way. Uh, and as Steve said, starting in calendar year, maybe Steve and his team can put together a little timeline and shoot us out a memo in terms of how they're thinking about uh, sketching this out so that there's touch points with the board along the way. Thanks, Sharon. Go ahead, Steve. That was going to be my suggestion too. If you could send us kind of a just a kind of a draft of what you think touch points could be throughout the the twenty one twenty two year. But Steve, did you want to say something else? Yep, uh, we'll we'll follow up with that um, shortly after this meeting. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing. I interpreted Mr. Healy's um, remarks as highlighting just the the benchmarking component of the. Uh, risk budgeting um, models. And Ms. Erdin asked a question that seemed to relate to uh, the risk budget uh, itself. So I, I think there should be some clarity on um, uh, whether the, the direction is to adopt the risk budgets and then review benchmarking holistically across the fund, or is the direction not to ad adopt the risk budgets until there's there's benchmarking across the fund. Chris, did you want to chime in? Uh, I, I just wanted to ask the board, I would really advocate, unless you're very uncomfortable with the risk budget, so it's been a process we've been working on. Um, I think for the portfolio flexibility, it would be the most helpful if you would consider adopting the policies now. The staff's all texting me to try and get that question answered. Uh, it's not a radical change in the way you manage the portfolio, but it's a better way to manage the portfolio. So we would appreciate it if you'd consider adopting the risk budgets and you can include this as part of the holistic uh, benchmark study for the year. Harry? Yeah, my, my intention was to adopt the risk budgets and adopt all the policy, but just referencing Makita's memo in terms of uh, the benchmark. So. Great, Steve. Does that give more clarity and direction to you and your team? Crystal clear. Makes sense. And we, we support that. Great. And Scott, you've captured that so that when we, if that sounds like an information request to me. So you're clear on the direction. Well, well I, I was thinking that it's probably best to do a motion now um, 
for that um, as opposed to have it in an information request, but we have a motion to adopt the policies. Okay. And then, um, so moved. And from, do, you, do you need, Scott, do you need Bill to present a... Yes, well, yes. So, so I, I mean, we can, I can help formulate. Well, yeah. maybe, maybe I can read, maybe I can provide what, what I've captured in terms of what a, a potential motion might look like. And then obviously I will defer to you. Right. Um, to revise it, but I I have um, to adopt uh, to move to adopt the uh, risk budgets risk budgets now, and to have Makita conduct an overview of the benchmarks and bring any suggestions or recommendations to the board, tentatively to begin at the start of the twenty twenty two calendar year. So you know, I, you all refine that. Yeah, I, I would not say tentatively. I, I'd say by. <laughs> Within, yeah. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Chris. I, I just would clarify what, because uh, Scott hasn't done this a lot with us, but it, we're asking you to approve the policies. They include a risk benchmark, but approve the policies um, on consent, and then you've got your study for the benchmarks. Yeah. It's a policy revision. So. And uh, I see our general counsel chiming in, Brian. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that you're, you've moved the item from uh, from information to an action item, so the word consent isn't um, isn't appropriate. I think Scott captured the um, the motion that you are approving the policies, uh, revisions to the policies, and then this additional piece. So um, Scott, maybe you could read it back um, again with uh, taking Chris's comments um, of in mind. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Uh, to, to approve the policy revisions and have Makita conduct an overview of the benchmarks and bring any suggestions or recommendations to the board to begin at the start of the 2022 calendar year. Uh, can I just modify right. that? No later than. <laughs> no later than the start, of course. We really think about it as work plan, Scott. So it's the tw it's technically, isn't it, Chris, the 21 22 work plan? I think that's the more precise way of communicating that, Scott. Just we're all. <laughs> this is why we're a team. We're bored with stuff. Of course, no later than the start of the 2021-2022 work plan. Sure, <laughs> that works. So Bill has moved it. Do I have a second? Second. Oh, second. Oh. Okay, it's been seconded by Gail. Um, all those in favor, say aye. Hi. Hi. I'm sorry. I, I hate to do this, but because we're in COVID, we have to do a roll call vote. Okay. No problem. Scott, thank you. Thank you, Mr. General Counsel. Brian, on your toes. You had your coffee. Happy to have. Thank you. All right, Scott, can you go ahead and do a roll call vote for us? Thanks. Ms. Bradford? Yes. Mr. Keeley? Yes. Mr. Brazon? Yes. Ms. Erden? Yes. Ms. Yamamoto? Aye. Ms. Miller? Aye. Mr. Rufino? Yes. Ms. Uh, Mr. Johnson? Yes. Controller Yi? Aye. And Ms. Hendricks, would you like to vote? I would like to vote, yes. Very good, the motion passes. Great, thanks Scott, Brian, Makita, everyone for that. And Mr. Keeley. All right, with that, we're gonna move to um, item five, which is our pledge to net zero uh, portfolio by 2050. And I think we have Kirsty and Chris, I see Brian as well. Brian, are you, I'm not sure who's presenting on this, but. I'm leading out Sharon and then I'm gonna turn it over to Kirsty and uh, we've got Makita and we've got legal all in line, so. Keeping with our um, team approach. Thank you, Chris. There you here. go. <laughs> and then don't forget, you've got 20 minutes of public comment at the end that you want to bring in. Um, the, the goal of this, uh, you know, I, I really hats off to Kirsty and her team and Brian for working with uh, Makita, working with legal counsel to make sure we incorporate the, the history that you really have been studying low carbon, as the slides will show, for a long time dating all the way back to 2004 is when we first made our climate-related investments 
but we've really studied the idea and the challenges of a low carbon future, um, done a lot of research. It's only been recently that we really came to the idea of a pledge. As I always said, you've been planning this path for a long time. We just didn't have a, def a name for our destination. And now we are proposing that we do uh, of 20 uh, 50 and be net zero greenhouse gases. Uh, it means that you still will have greenhouse gases, but you will be sequestering or capturing and reducing them equal to the amount that might be emitted by the companies in our portfolio. Uh, and I think a couple important things to point out, um, you know, if CalSTRS is net zero by 2040 or even earlier, but if the rest of the world isn't doing something to approach that, it's not gonna make a difference. Uh, it, as much as I, the public comments, I wish one simple action could solve climate change. Um, this is a global and a complex problem and we need uh, the, the global, particularly China, the USA, India, and the EU to make massive changes. Um, I've made comments to board members, we, you know, we're going to set targets in 2030 and 2040 to get us to, to net zero by 2050 and the world needs to as well. We should see massive changes in our lives. Uh, we need to see massive changes in our lives that we as, as citizens of the planet start living net zero, um, where our energy, our transportation, our agriculture, um, is all moving dramatically. A lot more electric cars on the road, a lot cleaner energy uh, across the grid. Because um, keep in mind, even in California, we have no coal-fired plants. When we have peak power demands like we did this summer, um, because the hydroelectric is so low, California has to buy energy from Utah, Arizona, where they're still using coal-fired plants, and that's got to stop. So a massive amount uh, of the change we need is from outside partners on this, and we need to see it in our daily lives over time. Um, as you're gonna hear in the presentation, we wanna propose that net zero is our North Star, uh, but without question, the number one goal is 7%. We have to earn 7%. If we hit net zero by 2050, climate change is solved, but if we haven't earned 7%, uh, we get fired um, and we have not done our job for the teachers. So teacher pensions come number one, but with that is doing our best to work to save the planet uh, and to get companies and countries as much as we can to, to make significant changes in everyone's lifestyle um, and, and the way we get and provide things. So. Um, this is gonna be a challenge for us. It's gonna be a challenge for the world, uh, and, uh, but it's absolutely critical. Uh, as you'll note in there, we wanna be uh, in coordination with the state of California, uh, but the state obviously has different uh, fiduciary responsibility and we have fiduciary responsibility just to the teachers. So uh, I would expect coming up um, in uh, early November is the Glasgow uh, Next Climate Summit. I think as we saw in the IPPC report that I shared with you, uh, that uh, we're already at 1.1 degrees uh, and they predict we may be at one and a half by as early as the 2030s. I would expect that we'll start hearing people uh, bringing in that goal inside of 2050 to maybe 2045 or periods like that. We'll come back to you and adjust that as the world adjusts it. What, what we're adopting now and I know I've been criticized personally for it, but what we're adopting now is what the UN is recommending and what uh, uh, the world is pushing toward is a race to net zero by 2050. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kirsty and Brian to walk you through the slides and, and then the background. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Hello, um, I'm Kirsty Jenkinson, Director of Sustainable Investment and Stewardship Strategies. And I'm going to be joined with Brian Rice, the portfolio manager in our team as well, um, to also answer your questions, should you have them on these. If we could go to the next slide, please. I'm not going to spend too long on this because this is actually what Chris has just sort of covered in his introduction to kind of like give you the like the key points that we want you to sort of bear in mind as we go through this. Um, if we could go to the next slide. 
I've got six more of these slides that I'm going to refer to, um, and they're going to highlight the key points that, which are supporting our recommendation um, in the materials that you've seen for this, for the committee to adopt this pledge to net zero for the investment portfolio. Um, and as you'll see from this timeline, we're presenting this as a sort of a logical progression of over 25 years of climate related activities, which has, as the graphic highlights, you know, obviously intensified after the Paris Climate Agreement was signed by the world's governments in 2015. Since this landmark uh, global agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we've witnessed a real acceleration in policies, technologies, and also consumer preferences that address climate change. And what's key to sort of recognize here is it's those accelerations that are creating risks and opportunities for us as investors. So our activities, and now the proposed pledge, seeks to address these. If we go to the next slide, please. I'm not going to read through the pledge itself because I think you'll have read that obviously in the materials uh, and had a chance to digest that. Um, but I do want to reiterate, as Chris says, to think of this as the concept of being our North Star. And that seemed to resonate when we spoke about that in the last discussion. And it's something that we as staff have been you know, talking about as well. It helps us set a trajectory to the future. It doesn't help us predict the future, sadly, and it doesn't constitute an investment decision. Now, the Paris Agreement that set out a path for the global economy to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. But as our suggested wording indicates, and Chris also highlighted, and also in recognition of, of you know, ongoing and the most recent research from the world scientists, the IPCC report has been mentioned already a number of times today, there's a recognition that the global economy may have to achieve net zero before 2050 to avoid the worst impacts of climate change that arguably none of us want to witness. So our suggested pledge and the wording we've chosen for it recognizes this need for us to be adaptive to our operating environment as prudent investors have to be. If we go to the next slide, just to reiterate again, the sort of four key points. The pledge is the first part of a four pronged implementation framework. It will be backed up by a plan and a set of interim actions, both for the year ahead of us and for subsequent years, not least through to sort of 2030 is that first sort of milestone. We're not gonna just come back to you and future colleagues in 2049. Um, I'll be in my mid seventies by then. And um, well, Chris, we've already had the discussion as to where he'll be, but we'll leave everybody to figure that. Um, we're also obviously going to continue to report our progress towards net zero with you every year. And we're also gonna work actively with our partners, the companies, that we invest in and the policymakers to do the same. So we have to have this sort of like much more intense focus on where is the trajectory going and how are the checking points? And that's not just from us, but it's from companies, it's from partners, it's from governments. This is where I think a shift is really happening. Next slide, please. Bringing your attention back to sort of like the, th the three core components that we see, um, of, which would underpin a net zero action plan. Two of the components are essentially the foundation for us as investors, risk and return. Let me deal with those separately. First, understanding risk. Our suggested action plan recognizes that climate change presents a systemic risk to the whole economy, and that presents risks to us as a long-term diversified investor. And any net zero plan, therefore, has to be economy-wide. Again, Chris mentioned this in the introduction, it's incredibly important. It cannot just focus on fossil fuels or even the broader energy sector. Achieving net zero means shifts across broader industrial processes, land management, food and agricultural production, especially as the world is set to grow from 7.5 billion people on it today to 11 billion people by 2100. And we as investors have a duty and a responsibility to understand these risks holistically, not narrowly. And we believe we can best do this by ensuring that we have estimates of our current emissions exposures in our portfolio, and from there determining how prudent emissions reduction goals will help us manage risk. So that's parameter one and sort of core component. Core component number two is return. Um, I think as we've been actively discussing with you over many sort of recent board meetings and, and before, you know, where there is risk and disruption, there are also opportunities and solutions. And so our suggested action plan will continue to expand our investments in low carbon and emissions reduction solutions that meets the goals of the fund. We're excited about these opportunities, 
And thanks to your oversight um, of our ongoing investment policies and the newly created CIS portfolio, we believe we're very well positioned to be able to capture them across the fund as is appropriate. And the third component that I wanna to highlight to you, and it reflects the role that you as a committee has always recognized the role that we as CalSTRS can play, is that we do have influence with the companies that we invest in and with policymakers more broad, broadly, both as an investor or as by ourselves, but also when we collaborate with like-minded investors. And that our goals with using our influence to, is to shape more resilient financial markets that benefit our educators. So our suggested action plan will very much continue to exert this influence because there has to be alignment between governments, companies, and investors for us to collectively achieve a net zero goal. That alignment is critical. Next slide, if I may, please. I'm gonna take a couple of minutes before I wrap up, just to be clear about what our proposed next steps will be. So our recommendation in the agenda item is that staff would report back to you as a committee on our progress in these five upcoming year, um, areas over the next year in January, May, and September. Firstly, as this is a portfolio wide effort, we want to establish the most effective internal organizational structures to help us make the best decisions. Again, across the entire portfolio, that is an incredibly important thing to get right from the very start. Secondly, there's a lot of complexity in understanding emissions exposures and the relationship to risk and return. We're gonna conduct a lot of research and determine what external expertise we're gonna to require to help us do this really, really well. That's a very important factor as well. Thirdly, we want to estimate our current portfolio emissions so that we have a baseline which can help us position for the future. Now, the future is obviously filled with unknowns and uncertainties, but our role as investors is to manage this uncertainty wisely. There's no easy plug and play for this. Each asset class is unique. Fourthly, we will come back to you with a set of interim goals looking out to the years ahead for 2030 specifically across the risk and return and influence components that I've mentioned. And last but not least, we will work with our communications colleagues to explain our activities to you, to other audiences, to our investment peers and to other stakeholders that we serve. So that's the sort of like the near term steps. I go to my last slide. I'll leave you with these core principles um, that we think are very important that will underpin and guide our net zero activities. And I hope they'll be familiar to you as they reflect and mirror what we try to do and seek to do across all of our investment activities. So I was planning now to hand over first to Makita because this has been a, a really kind of like interesting, good effort between ourselves, really good discussions with Makita and also with Tiffany Reeves and our, as, as the independent fiduciary to kind of come to this point. And I'm obviously eager for them to present their perspectives and the discussions that we've been having in their memos. So Alan, if I can hand it to you, thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. Uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, members, Alan Emkin, Makita Investment Group. Um, to say that this was a collaborative effort would be an understatement. Uh, involved multiple people on the staff, internal and external legal counsel, and us. And we may have set a record for number of drafts to get the language so that it truly reflected best practices as they exist today. Uh, we wholeheartedly support the recommendation and encourage you to adopt it as a matter of policy. Thank you. And Tiffany, I know that you were also going to comment as well. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about this as well. And it has indeed been a, a lengthy and collaborative effort. And from a fiduciary perspective, I'm really pleased to see uh, that in considering climate issues that the board and staff has undertaken a really thoughtful, comprehensive and sophisticated process that's focused on and grounded in fiduciary duties. And you all may recall that in the past, we've discussed several key themes as you're thinking about fiduciary duties and considering, considering key decisions. And, uh, you know, the first one that we've talked about a lot in the past is clarity of purpose and uh, that this is grounded in the, the duty of loyalty and that the purpose of this is all about what's in the beneficiary's interests. We've also talked about robust process and diligence. This derives from the duty of care and remembering that uh, the process is important. And I think that 
that Kirsty's really outlined um, an exhaustive process relative to the duty to care, to, of care and the duty of monitor, um, continuous rethinking and adapting as scenarios evolve um, over the coming years. And also as you encounter new or better information. And then the last theme that we talked about, which is incorporated into this, this process is uh, communication, informing your stakeholders, uh, engagement, um, making sure that everyone understands why is important and how, uh, how this action uh, will impact um, your, uh, your fund participants. Uh, as you uh, as you move forward, uh, I think it's important to uh, understand and to think about uh, you know as transition scenarios evolve and, and as there's all these forward looking interdependencies, it's important to avoid mission creep. And what I mean by that is that the focus is not an environmental policy preference. You have to stay grounded in your fiduciary duties and focus exclusively on what's in the best interest of CalSTRS and its participants. Uh, lastly, I just want to note that I've been extremely impressed during this process with the knowledge and sophistication of your staff, uh, both your legal and your investment teams, and uh, I look forward to seeing them skillfully um, execute on, on your direction. So happy to collaborate with everybody going forward and, um, and provide any guidance as needed. Thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes our sort of comments and um, we stand ready with Brian as well, my colleague, to answer questions. Great. Thank you so much, Kirsty, and thank you, Tiffany and Alan, for your thoughts. So questions, comments from the Investment Committee? Betty. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for the uh, presentation to Kirsty, to um, Alan, and to Tiffany. Um, First, I just want to applaud the staff and the entire team for the very, very thoughtful approach and uh, particularly building on what uh, this board has uh, really articulated an early commitment to. Um, as Chris uh, noted, uh, dating back um, you know, over 25 years ago and uh, probably more demonstratively you know, since um, 2016 when we established our first low carbon index. And, um, and, and, and I just want to, uh, and, and I think what we've learned over that time, and you know, my time is much shorter than since 2004 with this board, but um, we've learned a lot. And I think, you know, as we continue to carry this out, uh, there will be more information informing, you know, certainly and refining that helps us to refine uh, the plan. But I wanted to uh, bring uh, attention to uh, what I want to really applaud was the attention to governance. Um, Oftentimes we don't think about governance until um, the latter part of the considerations and the fact that this has been so front and center at the beginning and I've seen other funds kind of struggle with this. Um, but the attention to governance and certainly uh, with the uh, cross asset class team already in place. I mean, that's a huge, huge development. I mean, in my mind um, and to really have, you know, that kind of um, uh, you know, relationship already, uh, I think is a great foundation. Um, I have every confidence that even, you know, the milestones that have been articulated relative to implementation, um, we'll take a look at those on a regular basis, but um, I, I can't say enough about that piece of it um, and not backing into it, but really getting that established uh, at the very front end, I think is so, so critical. Um, it's one of the reasons why so many other funds have made net zero commitments uh, but really haven't not known where to start um, and uh, you know, to try to back into it, to try to develop a framework, to try to fit into a framework. And here, uh, because of the trajectory we've been on since 2004, uh, I just want to applaud all of you. It is building on. Uh, the science will continue to inform um, what our um, partners across the world, uh, across the globe in terms of institutional investors, uh, how they will be moving uh, will um, certainly inform what we do. And what I wanted to say to particularly um, just so many who have taken the time to come before the board to talk about, uh, you know, just how CalSTRS should move. You know, the question that I always think about is, um, you know, what does the world look like tomorrow, you know, after we take action, right? And I really struggle <clears throat> with this um, notion of divestment because um, the world doesn't change tomorrow if CalSTRS divests. And I just have been very impressed by the fact that we still have a seat at the table to uh, really leverage our um, institutional investor muscle around what needs to change globally. And I don't wanna give up that um, 
that power or that muscle or that voice. And, um, and particularly when we know, as Chris uh, started out, that we have so many industries that we really want to be sure are understanding, you know, what their responsibilities are, you know, going forward. And so I um, just can't say enough about how this has really just brought everything we've been working on into a plan and a framework that um, I think will be successful because of the uh, early emphasis on governance. And so congratulations on that. And uh, I know that, uh, you know, just, you know, everything that Many of us on this board, you know, whether it's my work on Climate Action 100, Sharon's work with PRI, I mean, this is just all going to come and continue to um, inform how we uh, meet our implementation milestones. So thank you very much for the great work. Great. Thank you, Betty. Uh, Jennifer, Curtin. Thank you, Sharon. And once again, Betty just said pretty much everything that I was about to say more eloquently than I would have. Um, so I, I echo everything that's been said and share the thinking as well. Um, the only other thing I was going to add, and it's more of a, a looking forward um, point, and from my experience at least, we have been absolute leaders in responsible stewardship, as has been pointed out, in, in a way that really matters. And there's great pride in being able to do that thoughtfully while maintaining our fiduciary duty and everything that we all stand for and have talked about. And I, I know we will, but as we look at the action steps and we think about the timeframes, I would just strongly encourage us to continue to think very carefully about the quality of the data and the completeness of the data and information that's available to be making you know, very well considered decisions toward the objectives that we stand by and the responsibilities that we have. And that in, in doing so, that we're very um, ahead of the curve with a prepared mind on the active risk considerations um, that will be informed by that as well and the allocation of the active risk that, that we're able and willing to take. So um, applaud you know, this, uh, timeline that we've been on. I look at this just as a further evolution, you know, of where we've been a real leader and implementing well and um, applaud everyone again and just ask that we consider that carefully and, and that we set milestones that matter and that meet our goals. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, Gail. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, huge, huge gratitude to the staff both for the thoughtfulness and, and the, the shoulders you're standing on that came before to get us to this point. I think this is incredibly thoughtful and I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to support it today. Just three quick points. Um, Ms. Jenkinson actually sent me an article that, that said the, the title is, we need to see the whole board to stop climate change. And it, it uses kind of the analogy of playing chess, but unlike kind of using all the pieces on our board, it talks about how you have to play it collaboratively and that includes other governments and others. And I, I think that's a really great analogy to, to where we're going, you know, on not only on the CalSTRS chessboard, but kind of like what all the other players in the world have to do. I, I think that's really important. So I, I say that both because to Mr. Ailman's point that yes, this depends on other governments. I also think that when you see leaders like California and I appreciate the, the aspiration towards California's goals, which are obviously separate and apart from CalSTRS, but thoughtful and mindful of why we need to move faster than 2050. And I think as we see the world warming beyond one and a half degrees, I think we see why, why that's necessary. So really appreciate the thoughtfulness and the ability to collaborate with California as an example of a, a government really pushing these types of policy changes. Just two questions as we look at the, the benchmarks, and, and this is something to think about. One is around this, the passive investing. We've spoken about this a lot and, and what we need to see change within index funds, whether seeing an open source index fund that tracks to the S&P, for example, not unlike the, the money we have invested in the MSCI products, but obviously those are have fees and carries and we need, so what we need to do as a society to create kind of an open source index fund. So we see the passive investments and I, I do hear the, the concerns about some of the investments that are on the S&P, 
but we see all of the institutional investment funds investing in those. So whether or not we can see the passive investments change, I think is really important. And two is this question of offsets. And, and certainly these I think are too complicated to answer today, but as we look to the horizon of the information we're looking for, I think better understanding what offsets are and how we are accounting for them I think will be an incredible challenge as we move forward and certainly not one that that only Kelsters, again, kind of looking globally and not just at our chessboard anymore, globally as to how we get there. It's just two pieces of information as we consider implementing and executing this aspirational pledge, how, how we'll consider both of those and sort of the data and the collaboration and the partnerships we need for those as well. So um, Madam Chair, I defer to you. Those are kind of really long-term questions, certainly don't need any comments now. I know the team are thinking about them, but those are, are two um, areas. And then my final point, and, and um, just to Ms. Jenkinson's presentation, I, I do think the ability that CalSTRS has had is they have been uniquely able, and I really think this has been clear in real estate, in that asset class to really consider the physical risk of climate change in our investments. I think as we, and I, obviously it's a reality, you know, I, and I, to your point at the opening hurricanes and fires, understanding physical risk will be perhaps much easier than the transition risk, how, how we go to net zero versus how we make investments. I think that's just such an important part. And, and it's the only thing I would kind of add to the, the, what we've been doing since 2004, because it's been such a thoughtful part of our investments in our physical assets. I would just like to make sure that CalSTRS really gets a lot of credit for their intentional, deliberate analysis of physical risk before making investments. So th those are it, that's it. But again, huge, huge, huge amount of gratitude for the team and the thoughtfulness and the strategy that went into this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. Thank you for those thoughtful comments. Um, up to you, Harry. Here we go. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, five points. One, I want to thank uh, Ms. Higa, uh, our Chair of the Investment Committee, and you, Sharon, as the Vice Chair, pushing on this issue and your thoughtful leadership in terms of identifying this, this North Star for us. Uh, if it wasn't for your leadership and uh, Ms. Higa's, I don't know if this item would be before us here today. So uh, secondly, I want to thank Makita and our fiduciary council for their commentary in terms of uh, the issues that they uh, advise us on and their collaboration with staff bringing the item before us today. Third, I thought your point, uh, Kirstie, and as always, your presentations are spot on. Uh, your, your comment on the alignment between government companies and investors needs to be there in order for us to uh, achieve the, the objective. Uh, fourth, I really appreciated Chris's comment, and I like the thoughtful, prudent approach to this. Um, you know, if we uh, address the issues of climate risk and climate change, and we move to uh, a net zero world, but we're not paying pension benefits to teachers in the future, and the fund is not viable, uh, I have failed in my job. So this provides an opportunity for staff to accelerate where appropriate and uh, to slow things down where appropriate to find that balancing act. I think it's really critically important. And in closed session, maybe Kirsty, you can talk to us a little bit about those ETFs that you've uh, started to put some serious capital, almost billions of dollars. I think one was $750 million into a low carbon transition fund and in closed session, you can maybe give us some insights into to that. So uh, really already putting capital to work. And then uh, finally, Kirsty, maybe uh, you can speak a little bit about uh, an issue that's important to me and I'm sure my colleagues on the board as well is the transition to a lower carbon future net zero world and how we think about the impact on workers, um, you know, and making sure that uh, Workers have thought about, and this is a highly geopolitical issue um, as well. Um, I, could you imagine us selling our shares and who would buy them? Do, I would think some of the buyers, I wonder whether or not they care about the issue as strongly as we do. So there's a lot of complex issues, but specifically about the 
just transition and workers and how you and the team think about that in your engagements. If you could maybe comment briefly on that. Yes, of course, Ms. Kelly. Thank you, Kylie. Thanks very much for your points and on that particular point. And yeah, it is important to everybody to recognize, I think, that when we're talking about net zero and when that movement that we've talked about, which is global, there is an increasing focus on it can't be just an environmental goal. This has to be a broad economic shift that allows people to continue to prosper and to continue to you know, create economic development across different areas. So that very much is part of the discussions that are going on, not only with us in the investment community, but I think you'll see them highlighted at the Glasgow conference as well in terms of companies um, who are represented there thinking about that, but also the world's governments understanding how do you create a kind of an equity in the agreements that are met to reduce emissions. And so I think this element of equity as well as kind of like environmental goals has become a lot more joined up than it had done in the past. And I think that's something we're certainly witnessing when we're engaging companies and talking about, you know, how are you going to achieve these goals? How are you doing that in a way that also serves, you know, the workers, the employees and the others that, you know, are the beneficiaries of, of, of being part of that. So thank you for highlighting that. I definitely see the convergence. It's not perfect in all worlds in terms of, you know, the, the level of attention um, it always gets, but I think I'm seeing a, a much greater focus on recognizing that the two are incredibly interdependent. And if we are gonna have a sustainable economy, it has to be sustainable for the environment and also for the communities. So thank you for flagging that. Thank you, Kirsty. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, thanks, Harry. Thanks, Kirsty. Thanks for, for board members for your thoughtful comments. Um, before we go to the vote, I. Um, I wanted to go to make sure we get public comment. And again, we've extended the time. Oh, I apologize, Betty. You go ahead, Betty, and then I'll wrap it up. No problem, Sharon. Uh, just a practical question, as um, always, and that is um, the issue of whether um, there are enough resources to really um, fully support the plan. And, um, and, and I, we probably will get interim uh, reports around that, but um, this is ambitious, it's comprehensive, and uh, I know that um, you know, our reach is going to be you know, uh, much broader than just uh, within CalSTRS to get this done. So um, just wanted to put that um, on the table, and I don't know if there's any early uh, initial response, but uh, I do fully expect that we'll have this conversation ongoing. Chris, did you wanna comment on that? I can just answer briefly. Our initial thoughts, Betty, uh, it will increase uh, the continuous appropriations budget a bit because we do want to hire some uh, consultants and advisors who are experts in the field. Uh, but at this point, I, I don't have bids, so I, it's going to be a modest increase in the consulting cost initially, and we'll keep you informed as we go. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Betty. That's always a question resources. And I know, Kirsty, your team has been working furiously in hiring and will continue to, to do so to, to staff this item. I wanted to make a few comments and then lead us into public comment and then um, direct board members to um, item five, page seven, to the recommendation. Given the last item, just want to be clear on when we do come to a vote, what we're voting on. So the recommendation is listed right there at the bottom. So just make sure to reread that um, and, and have clarity around the recommendation for, for, for action from the board. Um, I just want to add, I, ca I can echo, of course, as usual, everything that Mr. Chair Harry Keeley said. Um, and I just want to thank again, Kirsty and the, and the team for uh, taking this on and being thoughtful. Um, you know, my circles at PRI, Betty circles at Siri, we hear a lot about net zero pledges. And I think um, there's a tendency to kind of, and, and we've been asked to participate in the past and things like this. And you have definitely seen, um, I would say maybe a tendency to get on board before the, you know, before uh, the bread's baked. And so um, I really want to applaud the, the team for being thoughtful and not um, even bringing this to us until we were ready for prime time. And I think it's something that I'm really proud of at CalSTRS is that there's a lot of trends and, and things that we read about and see about. Um, this is not a trend. This is about making solid investment decisions. It's about thinking about risk 
and the potential returns. It's also uh, making the, the teachers of California proud for how the way the ways that we um, as good educators do, we take our time, we're thoughtful, we read, we listen to a lot of different voices um, and do that with respect and honor. But then at the end of the day, we have to make the tough decisions. And sometimes you have to do and say things that aren't always popular um, in classrooms and in other places. And so I really appreciate um, the adherence to, um, and I think um, Jennifer Erden said it really well, like milestones that matter. I wrote that down. Just, you know, we, we don't want to do this because it's the thing to do. We want to do this because the data is going to inform the dollars that we invest and who we invest them with and, and how we interact with those partners and that it's meaningful at the end of the day to pay out the, the teachers' um, pensions. A couple of my friends just recently retired and were asking me questions about their checks. And so I'm very you know, integrally involved with people and the checks that they get every month. And we just want to make sure um, those resources continue to come to teachers, um, but in a thoughtful um, in, in a thoughtful manner. So thank you for that. And then I also just want to echo um, Harry's comments about the just transition that, you know, it's a, a bad investment, but we know the global economy impacts workers. We know that there's an intersectionality around race and income inequality and climate. You know, they, they're not little buckets of issues. They're all together. And so we want to be thoughtful as we enter into these conversations with our partners. I get really excited about, Kirstie, how you talked about, you know, the alignment with governments, companies and investors, because as you said that it clicked to me that to Gail's point, you know, we have, you know, the governor of California taking the, the lead on climate action. We have um, a lot of us are on boards of organizations that are trying to move and drive meaningful data. And then obviously we're the largest teacher pension fund in the world. We're invested everywhere. So we have a lot of influence on some of these areas. I wish we had more, <laughs> but uh, we have quite a bit. So I'm excited about that idea of aligning those three entities. So thank you for capturing that very succinctly. Um, with those comments, I'm gonna move us to public comment. And I believe Samantha has colors online. Um, we have 20 minutes set aside and I believe we have um, three minutes per speaker. So we'll allow for co public comment. And then if you can just review the recommendation, we'll move to take a vote on action on this item. Samantha? Okay, so our first caller will be Jane. Jane Good morning. Ahead. Good morning. To prepare my comment for this item, I spent hours researching why net zero is a dangerous trap and why 2050 is way, way too late. The United, United Nations Emission Gap Report now notes that because of human procrastination, we must cut carbon dioxide emissions by 56% by 2030, four times faster than if we started reducing emissions as recently as 10 years ago. We can delay no longer. But why try to convince you that net zero by 2050 has no teeth, when most of you have probably made up your minds to fall in line with staff's recommendations. What gives? Well, what gives is the misinformation that staff has been feeding you. For example, divesting is not responsible investing. Divesting does not affect social change. Divesting will negatively affect retirees' pensions. Engagement is better at creating change than divestment. We will need fossil fuels for decades to come. Developing nations will need fossil fuels for their energy. And a new one for me, an alarming one at that, came at the last meeting when staff said that the path to net zero is not a straight line. The curve implied will allow the bulk of emissions reduction to take place very late in the 30 years between now and 2050, an industry ploy that will be game over for the planet. Some of you consider fossil-free California to be radical, but surely nothing is more radical than continuing to invest in the industry that threatens the existence of everything and everyone that we love. Members of the committee, please make some good trouble. Follow science and your conscience and ignore the fossil fuel industry's talking points. 
listen to the vote that the uh, California Democratic Party has just voted on divestment of pension funds and do not fall for the net zero by 2050 trap. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Okay, our next caller will be Mary Kay. Mary Kay, go ahead. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, CalSTRS board members. My name is Mary Kay Scheid, and I'm the vice chair of the retirement committee for the California Teachers Association. And I am a middle school teacher with more than 20 years of teaching experience. As stated earlier, CTA is enthusiastic about expanding the low carbon transition pathway to include a net zero emissions pledge. It is important as beneficiaries and recipients of CalSTRS pensions, we who are concerned both with secure and sustainable retirement as well as our environment, that the transition to a low carbon economy is timely and has no impact to the long-term investment performance of the assets in which CalSTRS invests. We recognize that the pledge to have a net zero greenhouse gas portfolio by 2050 would meet both the United Nations Race to Zero campaign that has already been adopted by 120 countries and President Biden's commitment in April 2021 that our country will achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 in alignment with the Paris Agreement. However, we urge the board and staff of CalSTRS to act swiftly and aspire to achieve these goals well in advance of the benchmark date of 2050, because our future and our environment requires it. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next caller will be Marcy. Hi, I'm Marcy Winn. Hi, I'm Marcy Winn. Yes, I'm Marcy Winograd, 25 year teacher with, teacher with LA Unified. And, uh, you know, I just want to be really honest. Uh, some of you I know personally. I'm very disappointed in the conversation that I'm hearing here today. It's really quite distressing. Uh, 2050 is 30 years from now. People are running from their homes right now in Lake Tahoe. People are choking in New York on the subway. Uh, they're drowning on the subway, too, because of this uh, climate crisis that we're in the midst of. I heard that the CalSTRS staff member talk about, uh, we have to just focus on fiscal concerns. Look, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that Gavin Newsom signed legislation to ban fracking in California by 2024. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to know that California under Attorney General Rob Bonta filed an amicus brief to join with the state of Minnesota in filing a lawsuit against oil companies to pay for all their externalization of the cost of this climate crisis. You want to seat at the table? Lead. Lead the world. You are the second largest pension fund in the United States. You divest. You starve the oil industry of money for 25 new oil drilling projects for Chevron, for the largest ever for Exxon and Guyana. And you will change history. But beyond that, fiscally, look at this. I'm reading a statement on Exxon's mobile loss of 22 billion in 2020. This is from CalSTRS itself. I'm reading Chevron's rate of return going down, down, down. Exxon, I think, took a 13% loss last year. Energy transfer, the Dakota Access Pipeline Company, went down 5% over several years, while the S&P went up 13%. So come on, this is not fiduciary. This is not fiscal responsibility. This is recklessness. And I'm telling you, as a writer, as a blogger, my commitment is to make sure every teacher knows what you are doing in our name. It is not a proud moment. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. That's the conclusion of the public comments for item five. Great. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you, um, public commenters. Appreciate your input. Um, any other input from board members before we go to action? Okay. Seeing none, um, let's go ahead. Um, again, I'll just reiterate the recommendation. So um, the recommendation is to adopt the pledge, uh, the pledge, uh, a net zero pledge, and also to approve the proposed action framework and timeline that Kirsty outlined for us. So I would entertain a motion. I move the adoption of the pledge 
uh, and I would suggest that we enter the pledge, uh, uh, the the words themselves that are beneath the recommendation on uh, page 172, I think it is, or page seven of the memo, investment committee memo. All right, thanks, Bill. I'm happy to second, Madam Chair. Great, thanks, Gail. It's been um, moved and seconded by Ms. Miller. Um, Scott, I believe we need to take a roll call vote. Ms. Bradford? Yes. Mr. Keeley? Yes. Mr. Brazon? Yes. Ms. Erdem? Yes. Ms. Yamamoto? Aye. For the Director of Finance, Ms. Miller? Aye. For the State Treasurer, Mr. Rafino? Aye. For the State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mr. Johnson? Yes. State Controller Yi? Aye. Ms. Hendricks? I vote yes. Uh, and uh, Ms. Higa, is Chairperson Higa? Yeah. Very good. The motion passes. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, with, um, with this item, we're going to take it just a quick 10 minute break right now. It's 1027. We have, um, the investment chair back in the meeting. So Joy's going to take over, um, at 1040. So let's take a 10 minute quick break and we'll see you back in open session at 1040. Thanks everyone. Okay, good morning and welcome back everyone. Um, so we're gonna continue the open session of the investment committee meeting. We'll be going to item six now. Um, we've got three components to item six. It's our semi-annual performance reports from our um, featuring our consultant. So we'll start off with our general consultant semi-annual performance report with Makita. So um, we'll turn it over to um, Alan Emkin, Alan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members, Alan Emkin, Makita Investment Group. Uh, I'll try to do this in a thoughtful and brief manner. Um, the year ended 6.30 really seems like a very long time ago, but it was only 60 days. It seems as though time is either going extremely rapidly or extremely slowly, depending on what time of the day and what news item I'm looking at. Uh, but we're living in a very strange period of time. For the calendar year and for, for the fiscal year ended 630, it was a year of extremes. Uh, the equity linked capital markets, which is public equity, private equity, infrastructure, had extraordinarily good rates of return. That was the good news. On the bad news, you had a global pandemic, which to his credit, Mr. Elman is to the best of my knowledge, the only CIO in the country who identified the pandemic is a risk uh, starting a number of years ago. Uh, there was a change in Washington, D.C. based upon a national election, which some people are still contesting. Uh, the divisiveness in politics, both domestically and internationally, is unprecedented, as is the activity of central banks to provide liquidity to support capital markets across the world. At the same time, ESG investing, which was considered to be a fringe strategy not that long ago, is now truly mainstream, with billions of dollars committed to the strategy and no reasonable investment manager who, to one extent or another, does not incorporate ESG into their decision-making process, even if it's only for marketing purposes but it is mainstream, it is there. In terms of investment performance, there are really two big components from a macro perspective. One is asset allocation, which will account for plus or minus 90% of the return. And then there's the implementation of that asset allocation, which is generally less than 10% of the return. They're both important. You, as the investment committee, set asset allocation policy based upon the advice of your staff and consultants. And you have committed a significant amount of assets to growth assets to generate the rates of return necessary 
to meet the obligations you have with a 7% return hurdle. You've committed significant assets to public equity, private equity, infrastructure, real estate, real assets, all designed to generate high rates of return. At the same time, thoughtfully and prudently, you've invested in vehicles to diversify the risk associated with those growth assets. You've done that via the risk mitigation strategy, the inflation sensitive portfolio and in real assets. You accomplished both getting higher return and diversifying risk, which is exactly what your role is as an investment committee and the staff more than did their job in implementation because every single component of the portfolio for the fiscal year beat their benchmark. And that's an extraordinary feat and one where your staff deserves great credit. Even though your decision made up the lion's share of the return, the value they added, and Stephanie will get into the details on that, uh, is enormous. But just to put things in context before she joins, Last year, ending 6.30, the S&P was up over 40%. If you use our current assumption for rate of return of the public equity market of less than, you know, let's say around seven, you've got five years of return in one year. Small cap domestic equities were up almost 70%. That's eight or nine years worth of return. International equity markets were up over 33%. And you're not gonna to like to hear this, but your long treasury portfolio was down 10%. It did exactly what you wanted it to do. It didn't go in the same direction as public equities. And in fact, if you don't have a part of your portfolio that's performing poorly, you're not diversified. And so don't look at the returns of fixed income and be disappointed. You got what you wanted which is in fact a more diversified portfolio. What I'm gonna do now is turn it over to Stephanie who will talk about the report that's in front of you. And then at the end, we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much, Alan. This is Stephanie Sorg with Makita Investment Group. And I'll go ahead and jump into the details of the Calster's performance at the end of the second quarter. And for reference, uh, I'll be referencing attachment two, page one of item 6A. So as of June 30th, 2021, the total Calsters portfolio was valued at $308.6 billion, an increase of $62.6 .6 billion over the trailing 12 months amidst a global recovery from the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Calsters returned 27.2% for the latest fiscal year, a record high that far exceeded the long-term expected rate of return of 7%. Additionally, this return yielded strong relative results as the total Calsters portfolio outperformed the policy benchmark by 230 basis points and performed roughly in line with median large public plans. Longer term results remain strong as Calsters has outperformed the large public plan peer universe median by healthy margins over the three, five and 10 year time periods notably over the trailing three years with an ex excess performance of 80 basis points, equating to roughly over 2 billion per year in added value over peers. To state the least, this is as good as it gets from an investment perspective, uh, but do keep in mind that these results were attained during a period of low volatility, low and absolute relative volatility. Uh, looking under the hood, all of Calster's underlying asset classes perform, outperformed the respective policy benchmarks over the trailing 12-1. Strong private market relative results reflected solid and effective implementation within the inflation sensitive, private equity and real estate asset classes. But we'll leave it up to your asset class specialist consultants to report on the specific drivers within those aggregates. The global equity and fixed income produced impressive but very different absolute and relative results in the latest fiscal year, appreciating 41.8% and 1.2% respectively while also outpacing their policy benchmarks by 60 basis points and 80 basis points individually. Calster's external active management and internal portfolio management teams added significant value in these areas. In conclusion, Calster's continued to manage the portfolio in a disciplined manner. Staff navigated an unprecedented and uncertain economic capital market environment over the latest fiscal year. 
staff's execution of the investment policy is particularly noteworthy given the obvious challenges presented when working remotely. And we commend staff for their ability to adapt and execute over the trailing 12 months. With that, I'll turn it back over to the committee to answer any questions. Great, thanks very much, Stephanie. And um, thank you, Alan. Um, I'll open it up to the committee if there are any, um, if there are any questions. Um, let's go first um, to the controller. Over to Betty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you very much for the um, report. Um, just had a couple questions, and maybe it's getting too granular, but I'm, I'm just curious about a, a couple things. Um, so um, I'm looking at one of the slides, I think it's 525, where um, I was just curious about the performance uh, in the one-year period of um, State Street and its overperformance. Um, uh, and then uh, CalStar is outperforming State Street in the three, five, and 10-year period. And just wanted to kind of get a sense of whether that's noteworthy or is it a blip or kind of just what was that? Oh, Steph. You may not have the answer to that. Uh, if you don't, uh, I think the staff is probably best prepared to address that question. Okay. I would defer to staff. Yes, I, I think that I'm not on the um, exact page you're on, Betty, but I think one of the things that's notable to me is, and what's exciting, is uh, the outperformance of, you know, to benchmarks. And as, as Alan yeah. was saying, it was a unique year. Gosh, every asset class outperformed. But even more interesting to me is the consistency over time. And so if we were median this year with 2.3% alpha, if we looked out three years, five years, 10 years, you see that we start to, to um, descend into the top quartile of investment funds. And so I think one of the hallmarks of our team is that we're just consistently trying to execute transaction by transaction and, and that's the thing that I'm, I'm really most um, excited about is, is that consistency. And of course, we've, we've talked about um, the strategies to get us there, one of them, them being the collaborative model. I'm not sure okay. if that answers your question or you wanted some more detail, Betty. No, I, 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 we'll get back to you with the specific answer to your question. No, that's right. fine. And, and I realize, you know, when we talk about one year in the context of what's happening today, it's kind of a different kind of one year as we <laughs> think about in the past. So, um, the, the, uh, no, that, that'd be fine. Um, just curious about that. And then um, over the past six months, I've seen that, um, you know, global equities, uh, the, the, the global equities allocation decreased by 1%. And I know that's part of the change that we made during the ALM process. And um, we're just curious if you think that's still the best approach given the strong returns in global equity the past year. And again, sure. um, you know, the past year may not be kind of indicative of how we should be looking at it, you know, long term. Let me give you my take on that first, Madam Controller, and then Scott might have some comments. Uh, and I think, We'll also be addressing this in closed session because I think there are some issues that are probably more appropriate for closed. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that the staff through the rack constantly readjusted and took profits from the equity portfolio over the course of the year. And they also reduced the exposure because of the change in asset allocation. The one way of answering your question, Madam Controller, is, is now a good time. If anyone really knew the answer to that question, they wouldn't share it with you. They would keep it to themselves. And, and that's not to be humble. There's just no evidence that anyone can consistently get it right. And the cost of getting it wrong, particularly given your 7% hurdle, the cost of getting it wrong is really extraordinary. Yeah. So sticking to the discipline, recognizing you're a long-term investor, that you have a growth bias, which is the only way you can come close to or exceed your 7% hurdle, uh, you have to stick to that and be disciplined. And Scott, if you want to complement that or change it. 
Yeah, I, I think that I'd first just start off with the long term and maybe then talk a little bit about the short and medium term. But in the long term, I, th I think you know this, uh, Betty, but the investment team is really looking out decades. We're creating a diversified portfolio of assets that we think are going to perform over a variety of market environments, both great ones like we just had and bad ones um, like we actually had a little bit earlier, earlier than that, all in one, in one cycle, one quick cycle. <laughs> And so I think that um, for us, it's about allocating the assets over that long term. And as Alan was saying, the board has um, uh, put together this asset allocation that we're executing on. So that's number one. And if I looked at the 30 year number, we're 8.6%, that exceeded the 7%, 9.7% over the past decade, 11.8% over the last five years. We've had the COVID crisis there, the 2008 Great Recession, the 2000 tech bubble and burst in 2000. And so we're, we're trying to build the best asset allocation to weather all of these environments of which, as Alan stated, they tend to be somewhat unpredictable. Um, but if I were to look at the, the short and near term, Alan also spoke of, and I agree with this, that you know, look, just in the first year of this recovery, we, we pr we're probably mid cycle. From, if you looked at past cycles, because we've had that much of a, a gain, maybe four or five years of, of equity returns just in, in sort of one part of that cycle. And so, you know, credit the team. We'll talk a little bit more about this in tech, but we went into the crisis underweight equities, overweight bonds, and then had to quickly pivot 180 to capture the growth in the markets being overweight equities and underweight bonds. So I think that what we try to do is we try to tilt the portfolio to capture some of those midterm and short-term dynamics, which, you know, the RAC is meeting um, weekly, if need to, we were meeting daily during the crisis. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, hopefully that gives you a sense of how we're um, looking at the asset allocation and tilting it uh, to achieve these returns. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I know it requires uh, just the... Uh, uh, just just a frequent um, uh, diligence uh, um, in terms of um, the, the, what the RAC's looking at. Uh, you raised bonds, um, Scott, and I'm just uh, curious about the Fed's announcement that it uh, plans to pull back on bond purchases and uh, but likely not raise rates for the rest of the year. Just wanted to get a sense of whether you expect any particular impacts um, resulting from that on the markets. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, one of the things I would describe the, these markets as is essentially a tug of war. On the, on the one end of the spectrum, you have the, the tremendous amount of fiscal spending, tremendous amount of, um, of, of liquidity being provided by the Fed. And if I were to look on that side of the thing, side of the equation, money markets are at records. So there might be five trillion or so in there. Uh, the, the amount of bond flows, maybe 1.9 trillion uh, during this period. So there's a lot of money that could flow into risk assets. And that's exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing, historic, if I were to show you this chart, historic fund flows into risk assets, because that's where the markets are being pushed by the government and, and the Fed, right? Mm -hmm. but I think that's the big picture of, of one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is you know, on the margin, fundamentals might be deteriorating. You know, we've got the, the we're still working through the COVID crisis, um, interest rates that you mentioned, uh, I think will go up over time. They can't remain as low as they are forever. And there are other issues that we discussed at, at board meetings, inflation, uh, the, the specter of China and, and the regulations that are going on, on there. So I think that this is the tug of war between the fundamentals and the sheer fund flows that are that are moving the markets uh, through the government's stimulus, all the spending for the recovery, as well as the um, the Fed. Yeah. Okay. And just to, without wanting to pile on, people in our business have are looking at a fact circumstance that's unusual, if not unprecedented, and that is we have the lowest interest rates in history, and in the front page of every day we talk about inflation. Okay. I mean, having lived through bouts of inflation, historically, when inflation is on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, interest rates go up. Well, in fact, there's been next to no movement. And that is forcing 
investors who want to get any return into risk assets because the low risk assets in today's environment, that 30 year bond has a negative real rate of return over its whole holding period. So holding that, you're gonna lose purchasing power for 30 years. Mm -hmm. If you believe inflation is gonna be better than 2% a year over the next 30 years, which I think everyone would agree to. So there are some real contradictions and challenges that face investors in today's capital markets. Great, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Betty. Um, next, we'll go to Bill and then Gail. Bill? Well, first of all, I, I uh, want to add uh, my congratulations to the team. Um, it has been a remarkable performance under uh, what could be characterized as extraordinary and unique circumstances, uh, not working together, but vir working virtually, um, and dealing with uh, a, a just you know, a once in a lifetime event. Um, and so I guess my question is just, you know, uh, generally, how do you explain the performance and how well uh, each asset class did uh, by beating its benchmark? What was the secret sauce here if you can identify the elements that went into this great performance? Well, there'll be a challenge. I don't know whether whether Chris and Scott want to pat themselves on the back or whether I should do it for them. Well, why don't you start and then and then they can right. argue with you. No, they'll correct <laughs> or agree me. with you. They'll correct me. Um, <laughs> I don't often do this, but I have to state unequivocally that it's all about leadership and it's all about teamwork and the belief in the business model. And that everyone is pulling in the same direction. There are committees like the RAC, which just demand collaboration. And it is reflected in all aspects of the portfolio. And as you'll hear in closed session, uh, the RAC, is, at least for the that period of time, was a profit center. It wasn't a risk, it, it mitigated risk, but it was also a profit center. So in my opinion, it's about leadership, it's teamwork and collaboration. Here, here. I think that, uh, you know, my observation has been that uh, this is a unique uh, organization uh, in its ability to uh, infuse good values, high performance, and a willingness to collaborate uh, with one another. And it's, it's seldom, in my experience, do you find uh, portfolio managers who are um, uh, not inclined to uh, say that when things go well, it's their performance, and when things go poorly, then it's the market. But you have infused uh, the value that uh, we're all in this together, and we have a purpose, and I want to commend you for your leadership, both you, uh, Chris, and Scott, and all the portfolio managers uh, that, uh, that are there. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, well said, and thank you. Uh, thank you for, for highlighting that. Really appreciate it. Um, next, we'll go to Gail. I, I, I... Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I feel badly asking this question. Um, some of this obviously is a change in the market. You know, we had an incredibly strong market. We would have expected some outperformance, right? And I, not to discount the incredible work of the team and, and how working together works. So I, I think given sort of the, the sustained changes we've seen now over the last decade in the way market works, and now this, this question of low rates and interest rates and, and the corrections, and then obviously the, the federal spending, I am curious sort of how, what forward looking your team is doing to see how, you know, obviously none of us know and we can't predict any of this. I understand all of that, but kind of two specific questions. One, I think the benchmark review will help because it is, it is possible that our benchmarks haven't kept up with the market. And then two, how we more strategically evolve given what we know and kind of given Alan's concerns about the contradiction. And if that does require another asset class, 
So risk mitigation, I think, was a stroke of genius and makes a lot of sense, but also was an asset class we created for a very traditional market. So in the market we're seeing now where you have a contradiction, potentially, I'm not sure I fully agree with you, Alan, on inflation, but between inflation and low interest rates, is this a time where where we want to start considering, is there another mitigating asset class? And what series of questions do we need to ask to make sure that our risk mitigation strategy doesn't only follow a traditional market, but is is forward looking? So I think that those are those are my two questions. And then just um, Scott, if you don't mind, my third question just on risk taking. And I think that's sort of a, a greater question to Alan's point about teamwork, sort of what risk taking looks like at Calsters now and how that's evolved and um, and how you plan to to do that in the future. Alan, uh, do you want to start off or do you want me to? Sure. I'll start off, but I'll, I'll be brief, Scott. Um, the portfolio really is well diversified. So looking at Unexpected events is, in fact, built into the portfolio. And in fact, there's been increased exposure to commodities. There's a full exposure to equity real estate and to private equity, which those are the managers that are the the most capable of taking advantage of bad circumstances. So that's built into the portfolio. Within RMS, it's really only the long treasury portfolio, which is static. The rest is in fact capable of taking advantage or even trying to anticipate poor markets because the way it's structured, the role of the long treasuries is really just as the first responder. If there's a longer downtime period of bad performance, the trend following managers and the global macro managers, we would hope, would participate in that and provide a real hedge in the down market. Scott? <clears throat> okay, so I, I think that um, you've had a number of, of, of questions which I'd like to address in, in a couple of different parts. So so one, one, one thing about risk-taking, Gail, and this wasn't mentioned in the uh, performance reports, but one thing you'll notice is, is that over time, our, our risk taking is below average in comparison to our peer set, um, but our returns are on the higher end of our peer set. So I think that's an, that's an interesting uh, shift, right? We're taking a little bit lower risk than our peer set. And if you looked at the standard deviation in the, the reports by Makita, and yet we're generating superior returns over the long term. Um, I think what you're going to find is that um, we're, we're very focused on managing risk and being appropriate about that. Um, that was also the concept behind the, the risk budget. And we will continue to bring, bring that forward to the board. Another item I think generally you're speaking about is opportunities and something that happened throughout this year. And, and I think Bill mentioned this, um, that, that we, we just have simply a great team. We did more uh, investments in between the asset classes where teams did joint ventures than, than any other year that, that I recollect in a period where, where communication was harder, where we were all working at home. And I, and I highlight that in connection with the benchmark study that's up and coming, because th this is th these are where there, there are going to be great opportunities for CalSTRS and where, where our peers and others miss because people are, 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 are assembled in, in distinct categories. And so where we can add value by connecting Two, two of the areas together, we're finding a lot of things to do in between those gaps. The final element, um, I, th I think I'll preview this, but there's more to come. Our um, Armas division, as well as our innovation division, they're constantly looking for um, assets that are diversifying to our portfolio that could do well uh, in, in periods where, where other things don't do well. That, as you can imagine, it's not an easy test. There's not a lot of those types of assets, uh, but knowing what they're doing, there's a little bit more to come as, as they, they roll out um, some of these initiatives in the future. Chris, you want to comment? No, Scott, I just wanted to help uh, and it may confuse things. I, without page numbers, it's so hard now, uh, but it should be page 241, a State Street uh, page that shows 10-year risk and five-year risk. So it's a scatter plot. It looks really busy. 
But it shows, it demonstrates Scott's point that our portfolio is actually a little bit below median risk, uh, but we had higher returns. So we're in the right quadrant where we want to be. Clearly, there are funds that are more than us and less, but these are, uh, uh, I think these are all public funds, not just over a billion. So there's a lot of small people around us. And it's page yeah, no, 40, that's and Makita, page 47. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and then and Makita has a really good one on that too by asset class, which is on 207 of the diligent. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Gail. Um, next we'll go to Harry, and then I think Bill had a follow-up. Um, so thanks, Madam Chair. Just a couple of um, observations. No question. I, I would be remiss if I didn't congratulate the team on a, a stellar year. Job well done. Uh, really proud of all of you. Uh, also, to echo Alan's comments about uh, the importance of culture and collaboration, teamwork. Bill, Bill was spot on in terms of a purpose and mission, staying focused to that. And um, I've had the real good fortune and blessing to be on the board a long time. And I remember where uh, we were in 2008. Uh, after the great financial crisis. And we undertook uh, a really important self-evaluation in terms of the portfolio and the risks associated with how the portfolio was constructed. And if we look at the evolution of the construction of the portfolio over the last 12 years, not only has it been reconstructed in terms of the allocations to different asset classes, the ranges, et cetera, we knew why we wanted to do that, but then the staff has executed. Okay, they did it. They executed. And I think looking forward, Kirsty's presentation, what we've been talking about, to move towards a net zero future. Makita has pointed out perhaps a new asset class in the next asset allocation, a recommendation in terms of private credit. Um, I think we know where we want to go with the collaborative model. So it's nice to have that history where we were, where we are today and where we wanna go. So uh, my strong suggestion would be, let's preserve and protect the culture, the roles that we all play, stay in our lanes because it seems to be working quite well. Uh, and last thought, you all know this, we're never as good as we think we are in our best day, and we're never as bad as we think we are in our worst day. So job well done, on to Cincinnati, Chris. Thank you, Harry. Um, words of wisdom, as always, from our from our board chair. Thank you, um, Bill. Do you did you have a, a follow up? No, I, you know I think I, I'll ask it at another point in time. I think we should just move on. That's the, and especially after Harry's uh, very uh, articulate embrace and and uh, of of the team and uh, rightly so and and sort of uh, suggesting uh, how we move forward. Thank you, Harry. Great, Mr. Thank chair. You. Sorry. Thank you, Bill. Okay, um, so I think no other questions from the from the committee at this time. So, um, Alan, thank you, and uh, thank you to Stephanie. Um, also, Stephanie, um, pleasure to have you present, and we look forward to continuing to get to know you. Um, so now we'll move on to agenda item six um, B. Um, we'll hear, I think, from Taylor and um, Ben um, from um, RFA, um, and just a kind of a time check. We're at eleven fifteen. Um, you know, we have a we have this item, the, our private equity consultant report, and then our CIO report that we're going to try to wrap up in the next thirty minutes. Um, so, you know, RFA, if you could just um, Taylor and Ben, kind of just highlights from your from your slides to give the committee a chance to ask some questions. Sure. Good morning, everyone. I'll briefly go through the performance and then uh, hand it over to Taylor to talk about the uh, the market. So, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, briefly, the allocation was about 12.2% as of March. This is below the target. And that's really due to uh, global equities outperforming real estate over the past year. Um, and, but but the, the allocation is still within the allowable range. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, performance was, has been strong really across all time periods. Um, the portfolio has outperform, outperformed the benchmark across every time period. And uh, outperformance has also been remarkably stable. So even as the Odyssey returns have compressed over more recent time periods, 
Um, CalSTRS returns have stayed relatively consistent, especially over the past five years. And, um, and the result is that continued outperformance, and, and if you strip out the legacy assets in particular, um, that outperformance only grows, especially over the 10-year the time period. Um, drivers of outperformance, we'll get into this in more detail in the closed session report, but really you can, you can think about three things. One is, a, um, is the asset allocation within real estate. Two is, is the use of leverage relative to the benchmark. And then three is the, uh, the use of, of risk to a certain extent. So developing uh, properties. So, so how much of the portfolio is allocated towards development? All of those contributed to, um, to as we show here, continued outperformance. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Taylor to talk about the market. Yeah, sure. And I'll just spend a minute talking about the context in which the CalSTRS portfolio is performing. Um, we've mentioned before, including pre-COVID, that property markets suggest a tale of two cities. Um, if we could go to slide um, uh, seven, that would be that would be great. Thank you. Um, tale of two cities in the markets, multifamily and industrial uh, doing extremely well in 2021, multifamily benefiting from the broader economic recovery in pretty much every market at this point. Um, heavy demand for industrial has never really slowed or stopped during COVID. Other property types that are doing very well, life sciences, which has benefited Calster significantly, uh, self-storage, data centers, and medical office. Uh, on the other hand, office and retail, um, at least of certain types of each of those, have been oversupplied relative to demand in the U.S. even before COVID and are suffering the long-term effects from this. Calsters specifically has benefited by not being allocated to the retail types, particularly malls, that are hit hardest by changing consumer preferences. That's also benefited by owning um, in particular through development office that significantly outperforms the broader category um, and by selling over the past few years, many of the more run of the mill or commodity office buildings that it had in its portfolio. And as the board has witnessed in recent months, the biggest challenge really facing um, real estate investment is that it remains very competitive, particularly at the scale at which CalSTRS invests. Massive sums of capital are shifting at the retail investor level up to the largest institutional investors globally toward alternative and real assets. And capital held by private equity real estate funds is at, at, is at record highs. Um, this is certainly benefiting owners of assets as the value of those assets keeps on increasing, but it makes it hard to buy new ones. Alstors is doing okay though, um, be better than its fair share in, in winning deals largely because it has sourced and maintained strong relationships with good partners that can generate quality pipeline, which again is, uh, is, is going to be a benefit to CalSTRS in the near term as well as the long term. With that, we'll open it up to questions. Great, thanks very much, Taylor. And thank you, Ben. Um, let me go to the committee for some questions. Um, first, we have um, the controller, Betty. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Taylor. Uh, I wanted to maybe just skip ahead to, I think it's slide 19 that shows the uh, projected returns for the various market segments. And um, just based on some of the comments that you made, um, just curious why you would expect to see uh, retail returns increasing in 2022 and 23, um, given where it's been. And then I guess, uh, and, and also additionally on industrial returns, uh, why you expect it to decline slightly. Yeah, and, and this is, um, you're, you're looking at the forecasts by uh, real estate economists that respond to the PREA survey of returns. So these are essentially consensus um, yeah. uh, return expectations. Um, it's predominantly due to, I think, economists' tendency to revert to the mean <laughs> over <laughs> a long period of time, um, which, which ha has a pretty good track record of, of performing in that way. Retail suffering, um, in, in incredibly over the past couple of years, including into this year, um, projecting a, a really pretty modest recovery from, from very lows and industrial really being assumed to not be able to maintain um, the, the high returns that it has, it has given over the last few years, in, including in this year. So it's, so it's really just a moderation based upon 
what what economists have observed for a long period of time, and 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 we do expect that there to be some something to that uh, over the next few years. Uh huh. So so does that mean that we we expect that consumers are going to return to brick and mortar stores, or uh, what does that mean in retail? At, at least more than they have to date, or that um, values will be so low as a result in, in retail as a result of declining uh, values over the past couple of years, that even modest improvement is going to generate you know, meaningful or, or, I mean, even based upon these projections, still relatively low income returns um, based upon those value declines. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I don't think that the uh, the economist's perception is that uh, more consumers will be returning to the store so much as that retail values will just cease to decline at the pace they've been declining. I see. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Manager. Great. Thank you. Thanks very much, Betty. Um, you know, just one other question that I have is, um, do, do you have a sense of... Um, you know, kind of short to medium term um, shifts geographically. Um, you know, there's just, you know, be between sort of changes in, in commuting patterns, going into the office, people relocating um, because of different priorities in their lives. Um, did, how, how do you see that playing out? And, you know, what, what might we be looking at in that space? Sure, um, it, it's a great question. Pro probably the most significant question in real estate investing today and does require a bit of a crystal ball to answer, <laughs> unfortunately, as, as uh, it relies to a great deal on um, how employers will occupy offices in the future. Nevertheless, it, it, it is pretty clear based upon the data that we are able to observe today that the headlines regarding movement from coastal markets, including California, to more, you know, quote unquote, business friendly states, um, or from uh, urban areas to more suburban areas are, um, are exaggerated to, to a large degree, particularly this movement from the coasts. In, um, in, in, in 2020, the, the year in which mass migrations should have occurred, um, about 3 million people left California overall. That, that's a drop in the bucket relative to the overall uh, population and um, and I actually now that I say that I think I have the number wrong. We'll get back to you with the with, with the actual number, but it was it was really a modest uh, departure and 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 uh, quite modest relative to previous years as well. Um, what has impacted the the growth of um, of markets such as California and New York more than anything else is is simply the decline in international immigration to these markets of all types um, and in particular of, of educated immigrants coming from overseas uh, which which simply halted during 2020 and we suspect will resume in the near future um, the broader change has been or the more observable change has has um, been people moving from urban areas to suburban areas um, which we think more than anything is just an acceleration of movements that would have likely taken place in the next few years anyway, given just the demographic shift of um, generation Y uh, toward family formation years. Um, and so we think that that does create opportunities to invest in the suburbs, but it doesn't necessarily mean divestment in urban areas as there are young households uh, gearing to move to urban areas as as well. Um, so where where we're recommending our clients focus is really in those markets, urban, suburban, coastal, central, and so on, that have diversif diversified economies uh, with the types of industries that are generating a lot of jobs in, in the 21st century. Um, and, and not paying as much attention necessarily to to, to what types of markets those are. They, they, they really come in different shapes and sizes. Great, thank you. Thanks, Taylor. Thank you, Ben. Um, so no other questions from the committee at this point. Um, so thanks very much for the report and we'll um, discuss more in closed session. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now we're shifting to item 6C, which is a report from our private equity consultants. Um, so I see Steve, um, welcome Steve, and uh, Stephanie. Okay, great, we'll turn it over to Makita. Great, thank you uh, very much, and uh, good rest of this little bit of the morning left. Um, so Steve Hart from Makita Investment Group and bringing Stephanie Sorg back for an encore performance uh, here in the private equity section. So. You note in our report, uh, we adopted a new format. We're hoping that um, 
uh, it'll be uh, come across as more focused and provide uh, more information and commentary for board and the stakeholders. The report is organized around performance implementation policy parameters and has a conclusion. Uh, we remind the board that the data uh, in this report is as of March 31st, uh, 2021, um, due to the uh, PE industry reporting lag we've uh, discussed over time. Um, and uh, finally, while the report does discuss a number of semi-annual and one-year statistics, uh, we encourage the board to focus on uh, longer time periods. Um, just overall, I'll start with the discussion on the overall performance. Uh, looking at the chart on the first page, it shows that CalSTRS PE performance over the one, three, five, and 10-year and since inception time periods. It also shows the performance of the program's two benchmarks, uh, the Custom State Street Index, which is a representation of peer activity in market performance, and the Custom Benchmark, which is based on uh, Public Equity Index plus 150 basis points. The green and red arrows are there to show the PE program's relative over uh, and under performance, uh, respectively, to the re respective benchmark. Um, so we'll note here that the program's performance has been strong on both a relative and absolute basis. While the one-year returns are certainly eye-popping, encourage the board to, again, focus on the long-term uh, time periods, five and 10 years. Uh, importantly, performance over these longer time periods has increased significantly. Uh, just in case you don't happen to remember the exact figures, the PE program's five-year five -year performance was 8.35% uh, one year ago, and 10-year return was 11.4% one year ago. Also, because there is relatively little remaining value in the pre-2012 investment funds, and the more recent investment performance vintages have been strong, it appears that the PE, that the Calister's PE program could continue to show uh, uh, improving performance going forward. Another key factor I wanna to bring to your attention is the strong increase in absolute dollar value of the PE program. Since last September, the program has increased uh, in value by over 7 billion, while in the past year, the program has increased by uh, 12.5 billion or 58%. The vast majority of this value increase is just due to underlying asset appreciation. Uh, importantly, the PE program represented 12.5% of CalSTRS total plan uh, as of March 31st, compared to 10.2% uh, one year ago, and reflecting the 13% uh, the uh, long-term target. I'll turn it over to Steph to discuss performance by strategy. Great, thank you, Steve. Stephanie Sorg with Makita. So looking at performance on the next page from a strategy standpoint, since the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, returns have rebounded across all strategy types and on an absolute basis have all appreciated by high double digit figures over the trailing 12 months. The buyout sleeve of the portfolio was the main driver of Calster's private equity program's strong absolute and relative results, returning 53.9% over the one year time period and outperforming the custom buyout index by 550 basis points. We can see that this outperformance extends over all trailing time periods, which is notable as the strategy accounts for the majority of the private equity program assets. In terms of venture capital, the strategy posted strong absolute returns as of March 31st, up 75.4% over the trailing one year time period, uh, however, these investments have lagged the benchmark over all time periods measured. Touching upon the debt related and special mandate strategies, these strategies returned 26% and 37.8% respectively over the one year time period, but lagged their benchmarks on a relative basis. Uh, this underperformance stems over most of the trailing time periods with the exception of the five year measure where the debt related strategy outperformed by 50 basis points. Finally, I'll just note that the multi-strategy and longer-term strategy performances are not included in this report uh, as the aggregates are, aggregates are still newer to the portfolio and would not yield meaningful return measures at this time. Um, now I'll hand it back over to Steve to discuss structure and geography. Great, thanks, Steph. Um, so on the next page, page three, we show the PE program's performance by structure, specifically the funds and the co-investments, um, which are a key aspect of the collaborative model. While the funds portfolio is the largest and therefore the driver of total program returns, co-investment performance has been strong over the one, three, five, and 10-year time periods. Staff has put significant effort into sourcing and selecting high-quality co-investments, and they've been 
men becoming a more meaningful portion of the PE program, representing nearly 16% of the PE por portfolio compared to 11% uh, one year ago. Uh, on geography, in the next chart, uh, we review performance by geography. Again, we use the green and red arrows to indicate relative out and underperformance, respectively, compared to the State Street PE index. We know here that developed non-US, in other words, Europe, has had strong performance both on an absolute and relative basis, while emerging markets have been relative and absolute underperformance. These observations are consistent with our prior reporting. I'll return it to Steph to discuss implementation. Great, thank you, Steve. And that'll take place at the bottom of the page as well as going on to the next page four. Uh, the implementation of the program has continued at a very strong pace over the past six months. In the first half of 2021, staff has completed 36 commitments, totaling $4.7 billion, which brings the trailing 12 month pace to 52 commitments, totaling 9.1 billion. I'll note that these deployment figures are well on track uh, and slightly outpacing the $8 billion per year budget and is well within our expectations over that time period and given the current state of markets. The emphasis from staff does continue to focus on low to no fee co-investments, which is a targeted allocation of about a fifth of staff's annual deployments and has been achieved by leveraging CalSTRS size, scale, and reputation in the market. Staff has been very active, not only with researching and conducting diligence on these individual investments, but also hiring the resources and putting in place the governance to handle the higher pace of deployment and co-investments. Uh, we do provide the chart that visually depicts CalSTRS commitment amount by vintage year. The main takeaway exhibited is the prevalence of a steady increase in pace since 2013. And as mentioned, co-investments through the collaborative model are uh, becoming a growing share. Uh, with the continued increase in yearly commitments, it's important to note that staff has sought to maintain diversification across a number of dimensions while continuing to focus on quality managers. I'll hand up the mic back over to Steve to discuss policy. Great, thanks, Steph. Um, so as Steph just mentioned, um, we uh, the chart down below there showing diversification across the different strategies, you can see that um, the portfolio remains quite diversified and um, remains within the, uh, the target ranges that are described in policy. Uh, as we mentioned previously, the uh, total uh, value of the PE program is now 12.5% of, uh, of CalSTRS plan, at least as of March 31st, uh, compared to uh, the 13% target, so um, quite, uh, quite near there. Um, on the next page, just going to the conclusions, uh, as we noted earlier, uh, the PE program has had a strong absolute and relative performance, including over $12 billion of gains since last year. Um, staff has worked very effectively uh, while being on a work from home status. While currently, the, while the current private equity market is very active, uh, staff has been disciplined on focusing on its strongest managers and implementing the collaborative model through co-investments, which had helped mitigate overall fees. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, P program is near uh, its long-term asset allocation target. Happy to take any questions or comments. Great, thank you, Steve, um, and thanks, Stephanie. Um, no comments um, from the committee at this time. Um, I think maybe what I'll uh, do is, you know, this is the, these are the um, reports that we receive twice a year, um, you know, part of our opportunity to make sure that we're exercising our oversight um, of the portfolio just while we, while we have you here. And I'll actually, I'm gonna ask uh, our other consultants to, to come back on in a minute is just, you know, while we're here, just, you know, anything that, um, uh, you didn't already present or that the, the committee hasn't already asked that we should we should know. I know we'll have a chance to talk about some specific um, managers in closed session, but anything um, that we should know um, that you, you wanna additionally highlight for us that might not have been in the reports. Sure, I'll um, take a, a first um, uh, a crack at that and then uh, I'll let uh, Alan and RCL co folks um, add their comments as well. Um, one thing that we would continue to talk about was was highlighted some at the last meeting was you know this is this the, the private equity program continues to evolve and develop and so we've talked a little bit about um, collaborative model 2.0 and what that's going to mean um, not only from a policy perspective but also um, an implementation and um, where 
that might impact um, how uh, the um, the uh, private equity staff is developed and and grown over time um, as they continue to uh, execute and, and, and develop the, the new and, and uh, additional strategies that it's going to be um, focused on going forward. So I think that's going to be a, a key area that's that's not going to show in sort of the, the performance numbers directly, but but certainly is, is very important to um, have uh, the range of skills um, within the staff to be able to uh, execute on the mar- as the marketplace continues to develop in private equity. Great. Thanks very much, Steve. And, and um, thank you for the reminder. It is something that we talked about at our last meeting. And I think I'd um, just you know, let the committee know that um, the Collaborative Model 2.0, as everyone knows, is part of our work plan. Um, and I think in the November meeting, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, but we'll be We'll be doing, um, you know, um, the team will be coming to us with an item that's sort of looking broadly at the next phase of the collaborative model, and in particular, looking across, um, you know, our private um, cl- uh, asset classes, and uh, you know how those will evolve, how the market opportunities are involved, are evolving, um, and what that means for us in terms of um, staffing, you know, resources, expertise. Um, partnerships, uh, you know, opportunities. Um, I think we, you know, we know that we um, uh, have a duty to oversee and and manage our policies and the delegation and just making sure that the committee is informed about how, um, you know, how our our opportunities and the, the risks and the profile of our portfolio is evolving is important for us to have as context as we're being asked to um, consider, um, you know, potential changes uh, in terms of policy, resources, um, compensation, you know, a, a lot of those important items. So um, we'll be taking that up um, in November. So thank you for the uh, for adding that, Steve, because you're right, that's not the kind of thing that, um, that comes through uh, in a report. Thank you. Um, Let's see, I'll um, ask Taylor and Ben, any, anything that you, know, you would highlight for us that we didn't touch on um, in our discussion earlier? You know, I'll just echo Steve, um, and it, it, I, I think I did touch on it, but just to really emphasize that the collaborative model really is key to addressing this challenge, which I mentioned, which is the increased competition and therefore pricing for real assets, in particular real estate, which we don't think is a short-term problem because it's reflective of a broad global shift of assets, predominantly from fixed income to to real estate. Um, CalSTRS is is getting more of its fair share share because it it implements a collaborative model with its investment partners, um, managers, and so on. It owns companies that are able to generate pipeline establish very collaborative working relationships with groups that view CalSTRS as a preferred partner, which, uh, which gives it access to deals that it wouldn't otherwise have, and it utilizes the collaborative model increasingly, as, um, as, as Scott mentioned before, uh, to partner with other asset classes within CalSTRS that gives it access to opportunities that other large institutional investors just simply aren't thinking about because it's you know, it's, it, it's a ball that falls between the two outfielders uh, a, a lot of the time. So something that, um, that we're very supportive of continuing to implement and leverage as, uh, as, as the real estate investment environment really becomes more and more competitive. And, and just to give some, some data around that, so the, the percentage of the portfolio that can be considered under staff's control, um, so that is they have the, the buying and selling decisions is, is now 80% of the portfolio. So it's, it's the large majority of the portfolio can be considered, considered collaborative today. And that, that provides CalSTRS with access to um, the, the best partners that it, that it has and, and, and the ability to work collaboratively with them. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Taylor. Thank you, Ben. Um, all right, Mr. Emkin. Uh- Madam Chair, I'll be very quick, but there is one issue that that wasn't mentioned and it really affects all the asset classes and that's liquidity. And as your portfolio, more of it is committed to illiquid assets across categories and negative cash flow continues to increase just because of the very nature of your being a mature pension plan. There needs to be more attention to liquidity because you never want to be paying short-term liabilities with long-term assets. 
The staff is on top of it. My goal today was just to let you know that that's one of the things that we believe you should focus on. We know that the staff is focused on. It's just something that is just a part of good, prudent oversight of the investment portfolio. Great, thank you very much, um, Alan. And I think those kinds of um, comments and those kinds of highlights from, from our consultants to the committee are exactly um, what, we, what we need and what we look for, um, uh, you know, in, in every meeting, um, but in particular, as we have this chance to look at the portfolio um, holistically. Um, so uh, if no other questions from the committee at this point. Um, so Chris, I see you just joined. I don't know if you have a wrap up comment from item six or if we are, if you're ready to shift into your report. Okay. Ready for great. my report. Okay, great. Well then we'll shift um, to our next item. This is our last item, I think in closed session. Um, and uh, so we'll shift, um, actually we've got a couple more, but um, we'll shift over to you, Chris. Thanks, open session and, and your goal is 11.45. So I'm gonna be quick, uh, next page. Uh, to highlight for the audience, uh, the portfolio was at, at uh, $310 billion at July 31. Uh, the official uh, number as of yesterday, August 31st, uh, $317 billion. So we've already risen dramatically just in this current fiscal year. So hopefully many of the retired teachers who write newsletters are listening. Uh, they can put $317 as our asset value. Next page, uh, asset mix, very stable as we reported to you. Um, and you'll note that, you know, this goes back three years. I can take it back uh, 10 years. Uh, and the big difference is the increase in RMS uh, appearing and the growth of inflation sensitive, that little pink line that's getting bigger and bigger. Next page. So fund performance, I wanted to highlight as they did, uh, you know, I purposely put this chart in longer period first so that your eyes start at the longest period since we're a long-term fund. I highlighted the 20-year return of 7.6 uh, and the three-year return of 12.3 because both of those impact the actuary and what we think about. Um, uh, this was the last 20 years. Remember, everybody said these would be low returning decades um, and seven six is you know a low return, but it's spot on for what we need. So pretty spectacular long term performance. Uh, I love that eight point six over the thirty year time period. Uh, it's just remarkable. So uh, hats off as everybody said to the staff. Those are the numbers to look for. Next page. Um, this is the risk budget. Real quick, uh, I appreciate your adopting those today. Um, the risk report, I really want to highlight that in the uh, board packet, the written risk report that follows the cover page. That's done by Geraldine Jimenez and her staff of Josh Dietish and team. Uh, that's where the risk budgets are going to be and the targets um, and the actual portfolio all the time. So you can always look there and get that information. They do just a, a great job. Next page. Uh, these are the leverage limits in real estate, another risk measure we look at. Uh, I really refer to Tyler's report. I think that does an even better job. Uh, these are all the way back at December 30 because the data comes in late to us, but it's another area of risk that we monitor. Next page. So as they said, looking on the horizon, uh, obviously the Delta variant, uh, and I've been trying to read a lot about the Lambda variant. It doesn't seem, it seems isolated to Latin America. Mostly it seems we have to focus on the Delta variant. Uh, masks are still required uh, in the office, vaccinated or unvaccinated in Sacramento County and, and uh, West Sac uh, Yolo County. Um, I already know some board members are starting to get booster shots. So hopefully we'll get more vaccination rates and higher booster shots. Uh, and then I put some unknowns because really you can't divide it between positives and negatives. Um, the Fed's question about when do they taper their purchases. So keep in mind, again, the Fed is buying bonds of all types, mortgages, asset backs. When do they slow down and taper back on that purchasing? Powell said at Jackson Hole that um, he would, they would probably do that this year. The markets love that news, which is kind of amazing, but picture the Fed taking their foot off the accelerator and slowing down that gas that they've been putting into the markets. 
Uh, question about obviously herd immunity, and then you know how does everybody do when they actually return to the office? We're doing pretty darn well as an economy when everybody's virtual. Um, maybe it will be very smooth and go well, knock on wood, but uh, it's, it is an unknown at this point that we just don't know what will happen. Next page. So uh, long-term inevitable surprises, I appreciate the shout out from Alan. The thing I will say is yes, I put pandemic on there for a long time had no concept of what a pandemic really was going to be like. Remember, we had never heard the term social distancing and things like that. So part of the challenge with these inevitable surprises is they're on there, but we really can't estimate it is an unknown unknown. We can't estimate how dramatic these may be and what the ramifications of them are. Um, you know, this increase in cyber attacks and internet deceptions right now, they seem to be company specific um, and, and very isolated, but uh, good Lord, there is so much we do in managing this portfolio. And obviously, as you know, in life, uh, online, everything is online. Um, so next page, I think is the end of it. Uh, I encourage you to look at the reports that are in the risk report, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, just hats off again to you for the, um for the slide that just shows um, the success that you've had um, and your team have had um, and you as their leader. I'll Thank turn you. it over to Bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, great report, Chris, uh, and succinctly made. Uh, just one question in terms of uh, uh, impending potential risk. What about the debt ceiling and the, and the failure of Congress to come to an agreement, which would be hard to believe they could come to an agreement on anything in these days, uh, to raise the debt ceiling, how might that impact the markets? And it's interesting, Bill, the markets aren't really focused on it because sadly we have been through this game many times before. And even when the government, quote, doesn't default, it has plenty of cash flow, but they'll shut down non-essentials if the government has to shut down and then ultimately it will get passed. So uh, while there will be volatility around that event, I think the market looks beyond it and figures Washington will eventually get back together. You're raising though what I have said before, and this is a very long-term problem, maybe a generational problem. So outlive me by a long shot. The amount of debt that we have built up to soften the pandemic and to really spur on these gigantic investment returns Ultimately, the U.S. has to pay that back unless there's modern monetary theory like Keith Yamanaka used to uh, very strongly believed in that the government will never have to pay this back because we're the U.S. government and the U.S. dollar. If you do believe that when you borrow money, you have to eventually pay it back, then, then at some point that deficit is going to be a serious problem for the USA and we won't be in control of our own interest rates. But again, that's probably a couple of generations from now. Um, I think the near term, you, I would expect some volatility here in the fall, uh, but you know, as, as people have referenced the RAC, um, we're, we're moderately, I wouldn't say moderately, we're, we're neutral to bullish. We really wanna just be on our asset allocation. We are worried about this equity market being priced to perfection right now and some level of volatility here through September. Markets had seven straight months of positive returns. I shared with Joy and Sharon a chart that we saw yesterday from Bloomberg. Uh, after seven straight months of gains, the market return in the next month is all over the map from double digits to zero. So it's tough to predict what will happen next. I have a hard time believing this, can just, this rally can keep going. This has just been uh, fueled by the Fed and it's got to slow down. Thanks. Great, thank you, Bill. Okay, Chris, thank you for uh, taking us through that as quickly as you did, um, hitting the highlights. Um, so we'll move um, to uh, agenda item number eight is a review of information requests. Um, so Scott, if you could go through those, and um, since I was not present for the first part of the meeting, Sharon, if you could just jump in if there's anything that we miss. Mm -hmm. So Scott? Yes. Um I've recorded one potential uh, request in item 6A, um, a request as to the fund's slight underperformance 
compared to the State Street Median Fund over the one-year period ending June 30th, 2021, um, raised by Controller E. I wasn't, just wanted to check to make sure if that was indeed a request for further information. But that was all I noted. Okay. Um, and then Sharon, is there anything that we need to um, record in this way as an information request regarding um, next steps with the benchmark or is that? We covered that as a, as a vote, um, as the committee okay. voting to uh, adopt the policy and that Makita would look at the benchmarks over the 21-22 work plan, so. Great, great, okay, perfect. Okay, thanks very much, Scott. Okay, and then um, agenda item nine is our draft agenda for our next committee meeting. Um, is that you, Scott? Mm -hmm. Yes, I'd, <clears throat> thanks, Joy. So in the November meeting, I would just like to highlight uh, four items. Uh, they're basically two, two items are new and two items we typically bring in, no, in November. The first item, number five, Geraldine will be bringing forward our first reading of the re revised IPMP policy. And this is just simply, we haven't revised it in a very long time. We needed to bring it up to speed with many of the changes in the rest of our policies. As we, as Joy was mentioning previously, items six and 13, we're really excited to bring forward two items on the collaborative model, one in open session, one in closed session. As part of the board's work study on the collaborative model, we're rolling out phase two. With items in both the open session, we're, we're gonna take stock of where we've been in phase one and then define phase two, as well as in the closed session where we're gonna provide hopefully some specific examples around that. Item number seven, uh, I think the cloud model items are gonna be, uh, they're gonna dovetail nicely well with the annual cost report and cloud model savings report, which we do typically present in November. Shafat's gonna bring that forward. And finally, in item 16, this is another item we bring forward typically. Uh, April Wilcox will present the semi-annual compliance report, which is an assessment on compliance to our policies and guidelines, as well as any ethic issues uh, this assessment, as you know, is conducted independently of the investment portion of our house or the investment branch. So with that being said, uh, I know um, we talked a little bit about uh, benchmarks, and so we're going to work with uh, Joy and Sharon and Makita to follow up on any items uh, that might be brought in the investment committee or TRB on benchmarks. Okay, great. Um, any, any questions for um, Scott? Harry, I looked, I see you went off your mic. Uh, go ahead, Harry. Thanks, uh, Joy. Uh, we can address this offline, whether or not the uh, report that Makita is going to bring forth regarding benchmarks would fall under the investment committee or the full board now that the full board is addressing compensation issues. We don't need to address that here. So I just want to make note of that it may wind up in front of the full board rather than the investment committee. We can work through that. Great, thank you. Thanks, Harry, for that um, that note. Sure. Okay, um, I don't see any other questions from any other committee members. Um, so thank you, Scott. Um, so I think that takes us to the end of um, end of open session. Um, thanks everybody for your um, for your patience. I know we ran a, ran a little bit long. Um, we will um, go on our break right now, and then um, we will come back into closed session starting at 1.30. So if people could log into the closed session Zoom, um, you know, a few minutes before then at 1, 1.25 or so, 120 to 125. We'll see you all uh, in about an hour and a half. Okay, thank you. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we have just um, completed closed session and um, there were no um, items, there was no action taken during closed session. Thank you.